We're delighted to be here in the Isle of Skye. Uh, it did li live up to the Misty Isle bit on the way here, and uh, indeed it's clearing now, and we hope, uh, like uh, our evidence, it'll clear uh, the ideas that people have about land reform. And the land reform bill is the main business. I'd like to thank all the witnesses who've traveled here today and to give us evidence, and to all of you members of the public who've joined us. Committee's pleased to have the opportunity to visit Portree and would welcome your feedback on the external uh, meeting of the Parliament that's held here. You'll find feedback forms in your chairs along with copies of the agenda for this morning's meeting. Um, and uh, there are pens available if you don't have one with you. You can follow the progress of the bill and all the committee's meetings on our website at www scottishparliament.uk as well as via our twitter feed and using the hashtag uh, hash land reform bill and our handle at sp uh, underscore rural climate before we move to the first item on the agenda i'd like to remind everyone present to switch off their mobile phones as they might affect the broadcasting system however uh, members of the committee are probably using tablets for the business of the committee. So since the papers are provided now in digital format, mostly that means that we're using tablets quite a lot. And we have apologies from uh, Jim Hume, Claudia Beamish and uh, uh, Mike Russell. Uh, and we welcome Christian Allard as a substitute for Mike Russell to the committee today. So agenda item one on land reform bill is the only item on the agenda, looking at parts one to five and part seven uh, of the bill. And we'll be joined by three panels of witnesses today and I welcome everyone to the meeting. Uh, the first panel uh, consists of Malcolm Coombe, the lecturer in law, will be giving evidence on in an individual capacity, Malcolm, uh, Andy Whiteman, an independent researcher, uh, Stephen Thompson, senior agricultural economist uh, in land economy, environment and society uh, research group of Scotland's Rural College, and also Dr. Jill Robbie, a lecturer in private law at the University of Glasgow. I refer members to the papers and questions that we may wish to ask. Um, I'd like to start off by asking Jill Robbie uh, a question uh, just now. She suggested that um, the bill could be improved considerably uh, to be understood more easily if it were uh, re-jigged, uh, if it were uh, shifted about in terms of uh, the ease of use by communities and landowners. And I'd just like to get a few words from her about how she thinks we could do that. Thank you for the question. I just want to state at the beginning that I think the Scottish Parliament has done some fantastic work the past couple of years in revolutionising Scottish property law um, and I'm very happy to be part of this continuing process of land reform in Scotland. Um, I also support the stated policy objective of the Bill of managing the land in Scotland for the common good. However, I do have concerns about this particular bill and whether it will contribute to achieving this goal in, in the best way. So an, a very important aim, I think, of this, that this bill should, should be looking to achieve is clarity and accessibility, especially with um, community bodies are going to have to be able to use the bill. And I don't think the bill is structured in a very helpful or accessible way. And I've given some examples of that um, in my written evidence. Key provisions um, of certain parts are not put at the beginning of the sections. For example, the key provision of uh, the Scottish Land Commission, in my mind, is section 20 on the, f on the uh, function of the, um, of the land commissioners. And the, the key part of of a section of the key section of part five is section 47 and that's again tucked quite far into the middle of the section um, after provisions of, of lesser importance i realize that the current structure of this particular right to buy in part five is similar to the structure in part 5a um, of the uh, land reform uh, scotland act as amended by the community empowerment um, act. Consistency is important 
Um, but I don't think that we should just replicate complex structures that have gone before. Um, connected to that point is that now community rights to buy and the law on that is a very complex area. Um, I would challenge a good lawyer to sit down and actually discover what um, the law is at the moment um, with the Community Empowerment Act coming into force and how to advise clients, community bodies, on how to use those provisions. Um, and especially uh, with a lot of, of the detail needing to be filled in with secondary legislation, that again does, does not help the accessibility of the legislation. Um, again, if you do this, if you make it complex and inaccessible, um, it produces a barrier of being able to use the legislation and it also increases the costs for communities of being able to um, use the legislation because they just need to get legal advice. Okay, I'm going to say this now, that all of the witnesses don't need to answer all of the questions. Uh, but if you do want to comment on any, you'll need to indicate to me because of the structure of this, uh, uh, um, of this room. And uh, if uh, everybody's happy with that, it's uh, an explanation from Jill. We'll move on to something that's uh, more common to all of the witnesses on land rights and responsibilities. It's the statement on this. And uh, Graham Day is going to lead. Uh, thank you, convener. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, everyone. I, I wonder how the provisions that are proposed might be improved upon. For example, should reference be made to international obligations on land and human rights? I also wonder, should the land rights and responsibility statement require to be debated and endorsed by the Parliament? So, Malcolm Coombe, I think. Please, it's, I think it's dealt with automatically. Okay. Well, good morning, and um, thanks for inviting me along today, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, the analogy that I drew in my own submission was to the access code, um, on which um, comes under part one of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003, which I think has been relatively successful. Um, I hope most people would agree with that. Um, that was put before the Parliament and approved and drafted in consultation with SNH and seems to be working quite well. Um, there is, obviously, to, 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 to make something have a bit more clout, to use a technical term, um, if it was to go before the Parliament and be approved um, in that way, I think that might be preferable. Um, if it was in the legislation itself, obviously, we'd have a certain cachet that would not come if it was sort of external to that, but that said, it might be trapped by the legislation. It might end up being trickier to amend in the future. Um, so it depends what it is. If it's to be hard and fast, so to speak, then legislation might be the place for it. Um, and, or, or certainly before Parliament and requiring Parliament to consider it before any changes came to it. So. There's a tension there. Um, it, as I say, I think what the committee would need to decide is what it's for and and proceed accordingly, if that makes sense. Andy Wyburn. Um, thank you. Thank you. Hello, dear sir. There we go. Thank you, convener. Um, I would, um, I think it's important this statement stands on its own and is not on the face of any bill uh, because I think it will uh, need to be, you know, amended and adapted over the years. Most, uh, I, I draw attention in, in my evidence to the fact that uh, a growing number of countries now have national land policies, uh, and that's part of good good governance. Um, and normally, a, a statement of this type would be included within a national land policy. Uh, I also believe very strongly that one of the most important things about this, you know, apart from having it endorsed by Parliament, which I think is fundamental, is that this statement should not be a statement of Scottish ministers' objectives for land reform. This should be a statement of land rights and responsibilities endorsed by Parliament, um, and it should have as much, as, as wide a, an endorsement as, as possible, <coughs> and it should incorporate the requirement to, to draft uh, a national land policy, because I think that's, this is the start, I think, I see a start of a process whereby we can develop a national land policy. Thank you. Jill Robbie. I agree with the, the statements uh, Andy's just said that, that w this really should get a broad, as broad an endorsement as possible. I think we should, w with 
a topic like land reform, it affects everybody in Scotland. Um, and we should aim to try and get as much debate, as much input and as much engagement from everybody um, as, as possible. Um, and, and Parliament is one of the best places to do that. Okay, that's clever. Okay, so we've covered those bits, Sorry, I think. Steve, Steve you want to say something? Yeah. Please do. Steve Thompson. Thanks very much. Um, I, th I think that's a very important point that Jill makes and Andy makes, is that um, certainly from an SRUC's perspective, we, we think that it's absolutely essential that this is endorsed by the Scottish Parliament um, because it gives you transparency and what we're wanting is transparency in this policy. Um, if we don't have that transparency, then it is, as Andy says, a ministerial decision which sometimes um, are, are clouded in subjectivity or um, party politics that, that are not open to the, not open to the, the public uh, debate for, uh, to, to see how these things have been formulated. We certainly um, wanted the, the, the statement to, to not just say what the intent for land reform is, and I think this is what Andy refers to as the bit that will likely change um, through time. But we also thought that the, it's key that the, the principles that, that future governance, support and regulation of, of our land um, are, are, are set out. So, so not just a statement of intent for land reform, but, but what are the principles, the guiding principles. Okay, thank you very much. I think we've uh, dealt with that section. I think we should look at the actual land commission now, and uh, Dave Thompson's going to lead on that. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Uh, good morning to uh, everyone who's in the, in the hall today. It's good to see such a good uh, turnout in, in my own constituency. Um, the the land proposed land commission uh, doesn't the title doesn't reflect the fact that uh, the consultation etc and, and the report of last year you know mentioned it should be called the land reform uh, commission. Do you think that's important or does it not really have any significance? Given that land matters, uh, I believe, will never be resolved absolutely at any point in time. There's going to be a need for continual reform. Is it important we actually have reform in the title? Steve Thompson. Um, I, I certainly don't think you need the word reform in the title. Uh, it should be about governance of land and, and um, oversight uh, of land, land issues, uh, whether it's part of a reform process or not. Um, according, to, according to the bill, it, it deals with any policy um, regarding land. So why, why, just le why leave it at land reform? Um, you, you then stymie the, the, the commissioners in their, in their ability to, to, de to deliver on wider issues, perhaps, which they might have insight into. Andy Whiteman. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, um, I think it's important that, obviously, the Scottish Land Commission uh, takes a lead in many topics concerning land reform, but I think it would be misleading to call it a Scottish Land Reform Commission. Um, and I, I would support uh, leaving it as a Scottish Land Commission. Uh, as I suggest in my evidence, it should also have the responsibility of developing a national land policy, and it should be following uh, international best practice, as uh, has already been set out in the UN's voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure. So I see the Land Commission's job as taking quite a broad, uh, in-depth uh, overview of land policy in Scotland, and much of its work will be concerned with proposals and ideas around land reform, but that would be a subset of its responsibilities. Okay, uh, Malcolm? Malcolm Coombe. Okay, two quick points. The first would be um, if including the word reform in the title was to be so inflammatory as to leave some people not keen to engage with the new entity, that would be a problem. That would be a problem. So, therefore, the sort of path of least resistance would seem to be Scottish Land Commission. The second point to note quickly would be, and this is an analogy with another jurisdiction in South Africa, uh, the post-apartheid constitution on the face of it recognises that land reform is part of the public interest. And they are obviously completely different social setting, much different uh, in terms of social pressures that they have there. But on the face of their sort of post-apartheid regime, they are committed to doing that. So including reform in the title, just to go completely against what I've just said about it being inflammatory, if it was to say, this is what we're about, then that's fine. If that is the recognised policy of what they are getting at, and it's on the face of it, and having the word in the title in that regard might be a good thing. 
The Irish Land Commission in the 1920s was very political. It didn't have the word reform in it Quite. at all. Um, Dave? Yeah, thanks very much indeed, and thanks for, for these answers. Uh, just to follow on on the LRRS, I just wonder if the, the panellists um, think there should be a requirement uh, to integrate its work with other land use policies and strategies, like the land use strategy, for instance. Um, and in terms of the range of expertise and experience that's recommended uh, for the Commission, do member, do the panellists believe that should be extended, covering things like Gaelic, let's say, or land management, or forestry, or other matters? Steve? Stephen Thompson. Um, in, in our submission, in SRUC's submission, we actually suggested, uh, akin to what Andy Whiteman is saying, is that the, the Commission should actually develop a, a wider land policy over the next uh, over the next period, and it's that land policy rather than the, the statement in itself, I think, that would bring together uh, in a much more realistic and integrated manner all the different all the different policy strands. Because we do, uh, and we have to be honest here, is we have we have relatively competing policy signals for rural areas and policy priorities. Um, so we, so we have got we we have policy conflict at times. Uh, and having oversight of that and trying to pull together things in a coherent manner might be a useful, a useful tool or a useful uh, uh, job for the Commission to do. Malcolm Coombe. Two points. In terms of integration to things like the Scottish land use st strategy, I would be perfectly happy with that and that would be fine. Um, in terms of whether or not Scottish land commissioners should have certain other th things that they have to sort of abide by built into the statute that there's, I think there's six listed um, or in terms of what they should have reference to. That's not a, an exhaustive list. So there are other things that can be taken on. So in that regard, maybe it doesn't need anything else. But in terms of my own evidence, I suggested that Gaelic might have a bigger role in the statute. Um, a certain analogy might be drawn with the Scottish Land Court Act 1993 and the Croft of Scotland Act 1993, which requires, um, for example, a crofting commissioner to have knowledge of the Gaelic language. And I think that would, it would have benefits in terms of understanding what the land's about, being able to unlock place names and things like that. That maybe is less a tangible a benefit. Um, it might have benefits for the language itself. I know that's not necessarily what the Scottish Land Commission would be for, but there we go. I, I, I think it could be a positive step to have Gaelic involved. Arguably, some of that is built into the Gaelic Language Scotland Act 2005 anyway, but and to be consistent with the two 1993 statutes that I mentioned there, I think it would be good to have Gaelic on the face of the bill. And Andy Whiteman? Uh, yes. I certainly, um, given that I believe the Scottish Land Commission should have a responsibility to develop a national land policy, the land use strategy should in turn be part of that. We've suffered, I think, since devolution in having a very ad hoc approach to land uh, matters, and that's why I'm particularly uh, pleased to see the Land Commission uh, proposal. Uh, there are areas of neglected policy. I, I highlight the question of common good, which is still not an area that's been subjected to enough Detailed scrutiny needs quite a lot of reform. Those are the kind of topics, the sort of forgotten about topics that fall between the responsibilities of ministers, etc. that the Land Commission can effectively pick up, uh, draw to attention, do some work and integrate with other government policy. And I think the integrative function is, is critical because one of the purposes of the Commission, in my view, is to be able to identify bits of government policy that conflict on a land uh, in, in terms of a land policy between, for example, um, housing policy and, and, and fiscal policy, uh, perhaps. In terms of the expertise, I am relaxed about the, the expertise requirements that are laid down in the bill. The, uh, this is going to be quite a high-level commission dealing with some complex areas of policy, etc. Obviously, it needs to draw on expertise um, from uh, those who own and manage uh, land, whether that be housing or factories or rivers or harbours. Uh, but... You, you couldn't have a special place for any particular expertise because there are dozens of areas of expertise when it comes to land. And Jill, Robbie? Yeah, I, I agree with the comments of the uh, other witnesses that um, there should be a coordinated 
um, uh, response in the statement, it should take into account other documentation. In terms of the land commissioners, I think there has been a notable exception of experience in land management um, listed in the factors in, se in section nine. And I don't think, although Malcolm is saying that we can take other views into account, this is not a um, exhaustive list. Uh, I don't think we should uh, provide a list that does block out main um, people who should be part of the process and part of the collaborative response to land reform. Um, I would also endorse um, Malcolm's comment about Gaelic. I think that it would show a commitment to um, having a diverse group of people on the um, on the commission. And in that view, I think perhaps there should be regard to trying to represent people from different areas of Scotland on the commission to have some sort of local um, input of different areas. Thank you. Um, I have a supplementary from Graeme Day, first of all. Uh, thank you, Kavira. I just wonder uh, how the panel feel on how detached from government the commission and the commissioners ought to be and how should they in practice be interacting with the government? Andy Whiteman. Uh, <coughs> discussion in the um, policy memorandum, I think, around this. I don't recall all the detail, uh, but my recollection is that government is trying to set this up as not a full you know, independent commissioner like the Human Rights Commissioner or the Freedom of Information Commissioner, but at the same time, not just a, another bit of government, as it were. And I think it's very, very important that it has autonomy, uh, that it has clear statutory role, that it has a clear statutory reporting requirements, uh, it's clear statutory um, responsibilities to consult. Um, but this is a body which, in my view, part of whose, the part of the benefit in having this body is being able to take uh, both a, a deep, you know, radical perspective on land, a strategic approach to it, and also one with medium and long-term time horizons. And therefore that needs to be sufficiently removed from the day-to-day -day concerns of Scottish ministers. So I would, that would be my view. Stephen Thompson. Yes, yes. Um, in, our, in our submission from SRUC, we actually um, um, suggested that we would support the, the, that they are independent. They have to be seen as being independent of, of government and of ministers, uh, although they have to obviously re report. Um, and we think that, that, that that's essential to, buy, to get the buy-in from all parties, um, you know, in getting engagement from all the parties to, these, to the Land Commission is, is an absolutely essential role. Um, and, and coming back to, to the, the previous point about skill sets, one of the key things that we thought was, was that should be built into the criteria is that there should be at least one practical um, manage, land manager, whether it's aquaculture, housing, whatever, somebody with a practical background rather than purely an academic or an institutional background um, as part of the commission. And just coming back to this other point about Gaelic, um, we have to, uh, and I know we're in Sky, we have to be careful that we don't um, alienate the south of Scotland. So you would also have to consider the role of Scots. So it shouldn't just be Gaelic, it should be language per se that we're dealing with. If you're, if you're wanting to build that in, don't alienate parts of the country just by, by inclusion of Gaelic. Dave Thompson. Just, just one, uh, one quick follow-up. Uh, convener. Um, I, I take that last point. Uh, the, 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 the difference is that uh, there are far fewer Gaelic speakers, so it's a much more limited pool. Uh, you're much more likely to get a commissioner who at least understands Scots, if, if, even if they don't speak Scots, but even a, a Scots-speaking commissioner. So many people in Scotland don't realise they speak Scots. They think they speak a slang form of English, but that's a whole other debate. Indeed it is, but um, nevertheless it's germane and indeed the policy memorandum says that, you know, it expects the government to suggest things to the Land Commission to um, actually investigate, but as Andy Whiteman says, it should have sufficient independence from Scottish ministers to determine their own programme of work. So it's a balance between the government in power at that time and commissioners with a longer term view. And we'll see what other people think about that as we go through the, the witnesses in different uh, time. Um, we're going to look at information about the control of land and Sarah Boyack is going to lead on that. Thank you very much, Convener. And I also want to add my welcome to everybody, uh, not just in the room, but I understand we've got broadcast going out from here. So welcome to everybody who's taking part in this discussion.
a key statement in the policy memorandum is that there's a clear for greater transparency and that's certainly backed by the responses we've had to our request for comment. And I think the question might be how we would achieve this. So I want to kick off with a question to members of the panel. Um, and I'm thinking particularly about Andy Whiteman and Malcolm Coombe, because you've both given us quite detailed comments on the principle of transparency and how we achieve it. So I want to ask whether you agree um, with the fact that the restriction of ownership and land to EU registered entities is not included on the bill, even though it's in the consultation. Um, do you think the proposed provisions match the ambitions of the fourth EU anti-money laundering directive that was passed and recent comments made by the UK government regarding moves to reveal who uh, company owners are? And do you think that the bill will help to lead, uh, lead to a reduction in the amount of Scottish land held in tax havens? Andy Whiteman, first of all. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not, I don't agree that I don't agree that it has been excluded. I, I think the provision that was proposed back in December should be in the bill. That is to say to, to restrict um, any corporate or legal person to be registered within the EU. Uh, I, I don't think it matches the ambitions, certainly doesn't match the ambitions of the UK government, doesn't match the ambitions of even the Prime Minister David Cameron. Uh, I think section 30, Five and 36, um, 35 and 36 should simply be deleted. I, I think they serve no purpose whatsoever. Um, they're both regulating, regulation making sections. Um, regulation 35, section 35 allows people to ask questions. And uh, section 36 allows the keeper to ask questions. The answer to those questions may simply be a two-word rude answer. Um, the uh, Governor-General of the British Virgin Islands is under absolutely no obligation whatsoever to reveal any of the kind of information that these sections seek to uh, reveal. Uh, the only circumstances in which the Grand Cayman and Panama and Panamanian authorities would be obliged to do that were, were uh, in, in circumstances where there was a criminal inquiry underway and, and criminal actions were being investigated and there are international agreements to do that. Uh, so I, I don't think this will lead to any greater transparency whatsoever. I think it's bizarre that you have a section that says people can only ask questions if they've got good reason to ask questions. I mean, that is frankly, in a, in a parliament that has passed freedom of information legislation and has otherwise been very supportive of transparency, the idea that only certain classes of people can ask these awkward questions, or what appear to be deemed to be awkward questions, is, is frankly bizarre. And the powers of the keeper in Section 36 are powers she already has. She can ask these questions if she likes. Um, this just gives her a statutory, uh, a statutory footing on which to ask those questions, and there's absolutely no reason to anticipate that she's going to get any answers. Malcolm Coombe. Okay, um, I was an advisor to the Land Reform Review Group back in the day, if you remember that, even before the initial consultation exercise, um, and I had got comfortable with the idea of uh, a restriction on non-EU entities owning land in Scotland, and I'm still comfortable with that. Um, I've not changed my view. Um, in terms of um, whether or not what is in the bill at the moment, clauses 35 and 36, could be effective, um, to, to, to mirror the, what the Land Reform Review Group proposed. I think the answer to that has to be in the negative. I don't think it would. Um, in my evidence, I suggested some other things that might beef up um, uh, clauses 35 and 36, but that wasn't meant as a, we shouldn't um, uh, sort of for completely forget about the non-EU point. Just here are some alternatives if you, you're not going to buy into that. So. For example, there might be some kind of, I don't know if I want to say sanction, but uh, a sort of a consequence in that if someone wasn't to interact with a community, I suggested maybe um, if, the, if the land was then somehow deemed to be abandoned uh, in terms of the Community Empowerment Act 2015 provisions that were introduced, that would then lead to some kind of potential to have an asset transfer, obviously would have to go through the sustainable development test and there'd be full compensation, et cetera, et cetera. But it would be something that would have a consequence that, as Andy mentions at the moment, might not be there in clauses 35 and 36 at the moment. I 
think that's yes. I think that's a really helpful clarification. Um, and I'd kind of like to tease out some more around this. Um, if you had that um, obligation um, on the face of the bill, um, what might sanctions for non-compliance with the keeper be? Um, I mean, I think the point you made, Andy Whiteman, there was you could have the power to ask the question but not get it answered. So, what about things like cap payments or um, grants? A to what extent would it be a legal requirement if we had it on the face of the bill? And would that help in terms of making sure that it, there was clarity and certainty from the start so that people would know where they stood and when the keeper asked the question, it would be answered? Andy Whiteman. Well, there are, I haven't thought about this, but there are potentially uh, sanctions that the Scottish Parliament could consider putting in the bill in circumstances where the keeper asks a question and doesn't get an answer. Uh, it seems to be a, a rather kind of clumsy way of going around public policy. I mean, the, the intention of the original proposal, which goes back to the Land Reform Review Group, uh, indeed it goes back to, I, I, I put the suggestion during the passage of the Land Registration uh, Act 2012. The purpose here is to end secrecy. And the simplest way to eliminate secrecy jurisdictions from Scotland is to make it incompetent for them to hold title. End of story. If you don't do that, you get yourself into these crazy situations where you're having to devise sanctions that may or, not, may or may not be lawful. For example, if you're trying to have a sanction of withholding payments of EU agricultural subsidies, that would be probably unlawful. You know, then you're into the whole complexity of EU law and can you discriminate uh, at the end of the day? And, th and then, of course, who's not answered the question of the keeper? Who's not answered the question of the keeper is the registry of the British Virgin Islands. But they're not the ones suffering the, 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 the sanction. Um, so I, I just think this is a crazy line to go down, 35 and 36, as I say, just get rid of it. I mean, it's better to have nothing on this than to have a complex, uh, you know, you know, stuff that's just not going to deliver anything other than, I, I think, provide a bit of a fig leaf for, for government to say they're doing things. And, and uh, frankly, an embarrassment because, you know, the UK government is committed to, uh, to, 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 to transparency, to beneficial uh, ownership uh, registers. Um, just last week, all the offshore information was published in England and Wales. Scotland should be leading on this. The, the big benefit of... of, of, of keeping these offshore tax havens out is not just transparency and accountability and, and doing our bit to help avoid tax avoidance, etc. It's leadership because, you know, if the UK Parliament were to pass a statute that prohibited UK, uh, offshore tax havens owning property in London, that would be quite dramatic and extremely useful. So I think the Scottish Parliament, you know, could provide leadership in this context on a UK basis. Um, we've got a supplementary from Angus MacDonald, but Jill, uh, Robbie, first of all, and then Angus, and then we'll come back to Sarah and also to perhaps to me as well. Uh, so, Jill, Robbie. Thank you. Um, I think the Land Reform Review Group seemed to identify a, a particular problem, and there was a concrete solution that was provided for that problem that was quite clear. Um, that obviously hasn't been accepted by the bill, and what we have now is a very vague concept um, that needs to be filled in. And as Andy's highlighted, the, the the failings in the actual effectiveness of fulfilling the goal of the policy, um, and I, I think those are are good uh, concerns to raise. Um, I also want to just make the point that. Certainty and transparency and publicity are have been important principles, still are important principles in Scottish property law, but not all publicity is, is good publicity, um, I don't think. If you've got access to documents electronically at low cost and quickly, it can mean that a vast range of um, information can be obtained by somebody um, in an instant, names, dates of birth, addresses, previous addresses, whether there's a security over a property, which bank holds the security, images of signatures um, quite, can quite easily be obtained. This is the ideal environment for misuse of that information. And in England, there have been cases of people requesting documents to obtain the signatures in order to fraudulently transfer the land. Um, so I think we are constantly reminded in our personal capacity not to publish sensitive information online. And yet now 
um, with the completion of the land register, uh, more of this information is, is going online and will be accessible. So uh, on that background, I think we still need to balance the interests of transparency and publicity against the interests of privacy and data protection of landowners. And by landowners, I don't just mean a Highland estate, I mean a terraced house in Dundee. Um, so I think we should take this into account when, if this section stays as it is, um, then the regulations that come from it should think and carefully consider that, um, that balance. It does not mean that certain restrictions on information um, mean that the, that the government doesn't have access to the information in order to inform research statistical information on land ownership, um, but it just means that the information doesn't necessarily fall into the wrong hands. Interesting point of view. Um, Angus McDonald's first and then Stephen Thompson and then see where it goes from there. There's a few more bits to this. Okay, thanks, um, convener. Um, good morning uh, to everyone. Um, taking on board uh, Joe Robbie's points, can I just go back to uh, Andy Whiteman's uh, comments? He, he mentioned that, um, uh, that during the, the land registration bill uh, in 2012, when it was going through the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee in Parliament, the, the government had the same position uh, as it has just now on uh, non-EU uh, uh, entities. Um, now, clearly, um, the government's stance is in contradiction, perhaps, to, to the situation in Denmark, for example, where um, there's a presumption that the landowner uh, has to stay in Denmark. Um, basically, if the Danes can do it, why can't we? And I'd be interested to, to, to hear if the, the panel could um, uh, expand on, on, on that view. Um, to add to whatever's being said, Stephen Thompson, first of all. Yeah, just... Just to go back on the, the point about that, that Andy was referring to her and in our evidence, um, we also suggested that it seems strange to, to have a, a provision that the keeper could ask vol for voluntary information unless there's any sanctions. And the only sanction that you could have is refusal of registration of the title. That, I mean, that's the ultimate sanction that you could have. Um, but, but it seems strange to have that provision if there is no powers um, to, 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 to act. The, the second point on this thing about EU, again, going back to the, the December consultation, um, we, 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 we were quite strong on the fact that is there any evidence that by, going, by having that restriction to an EU that, that, that you would actually have any, any benefit in actually finding out who these people are in terms of ownership? And probably the answer is no, because... Uh, EU still allows for um, people to be hidden away um, through, through the company's thing. So, so I, I'm not convinced, and I, I don't think my colleagues would be convinced that that's a, that, that is a, a necessary provision. And the other thing we have to remember is that uh, there are some landowners out there that actually do benefit uh, communities significantly that are non-EU non -EU members. Uh, bringing in quite significant sums of external money from the EU, from out, out with the EU, and investing it into local communities. Um, and then going back to, to Sarah Boyack's point on cap payments, could you, could you have penalties on cap payments or grants? Um, having spent two years uh, working with Brian Park on trying to reduce red tape and CAP, I would certainly suggest that that might not be a, a, useful, a useful way forward because... Um, if you if you were to introduce a cross compliance measure uh, on these kind of things, then I, I think I think that would be uh, the, uh, against the EU principles of CAP payments. Uh, Andy Whiteman. Um, first of all, in response to a couple of things that Stephen said, um, it's important to bear in mind that if the original proposal were to be reinstated, it would mean that um, any legal person owning land in Scotland would have to be registered in the EU. The EU is already passing legislation, and it's already in the statute in the UK in the Small um, Business Enterprise and Employment Act 2015 to have registers of beneficial ownership. So even if you had a corporation set up in Italy, the shareholders of which were in the British Virgin Islands, there'd be a legal requirement for a beneficial register of ownership in Italy. Now, even that's got problems because it's very difficult to ascertain whether those who declare themselves on that beneficial register are, in fact, the people. But this, this, is, all, this is all a journey 
we're on. And, and my criticism is that, that drawing back from a meaningful first step in that journey seems to be uh, rather bizarre. The other important thing to emphasize to the committee, there should be absolutely no doubt that nothing in the proposal in December restricts anyone anywhere in the world investing in Scotland. This is not about restricting foreigners owning land in Scotland. All it is is saying that if a woman in Bolivia wants to buy a house in Edinburgh through a corporate vehicle, then that corporate vehicle has to be registered in the EU. And indeed, this is what big investors in Scotland do. I mean, big Japanese and American corporations, when they acquire land in Scotland to build factories, they set up UK subsidiaries. It's a sensible thing to do in many cases. So there's nothing really, you know, uh, odd about this, but it certainly wouldn't restrict foreign investment. It just places a, a, a requirement on you to register your interest within the EU. On the question that um, Angus MacDonald asked about absentee landowners, I'm not sure whether he's asking a question as to whether all owners should be resident because, I mean, we can talk about that. There's nothing in the bill on absentee ownership, but by definition, a, a corporation outside not registered in Scotland is absentee. So I, I'm not sure if that is part of your question. Uh, Sarah Boyack, to go on from there on this, yep. please. Um, I think the answers have been very useful in terms of the choices, what you actually put in the face of the bill. And one of the things about the test is um, the extent to which you think it's important to let ministers make regulations after the bill's passed, or whether substantive provision should actually be clear and on the face of the bill, so that when we are testing it, it has the support of the whole parliament and we can interrogate it. Um, so it's that choice about what's upfront and on the face of the bill versus subsequent regulations at some point. I'd like views on that. Andy Whiteman. Uh, this should be in the face of the bill. Any provision like this should be in primary legislation. Uh, it is in the Small Business Employment Act, uh, in various other statutes that are dealing with transparency and tax evasion, etc. They're in primary legislation, not in, in, in regulations. Thank you. Jill, Robbie? Uh, yes, I have quite a, a strong view that a lot of the, the provisions in this bill generally seem to be absent. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's difficult to have a discussion about it. Um, it'd be great to have provisions, as soon as you put them down, you can start to have a discussion. Um, but I, I, I didn't want to keep reading that the ministers can make regulations. Um, and again, it's it helps us to have a, a debate about it, but also increases accessibility of the bill. Um, anybody who's tried to find the up-to-date statutory instrument on anything um, will appreciate that it's, it's not an easy task. So if you can get these provisions on the face of the bill, I think it would, it would help, the, help the accessibility of the bill as well. Martin Poole. What Jill said. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Stephen Thompson. Yes, yeah, so I, I would concur, concur with what, what's just been said. Uh, um, there would be a nervousness of, if ministers can consistently change the regulations um, without going through parliamentary scrutiny. Again, it comes back to transparency. And going back to your question on Denmark, um, part of the reasons for their rules is um, on land taxation issues. Um, so there, there, there are issues there that, that is what the requirements are. And also for farmers in Denmark, in order to, to become a farmer, you actually have to have qualifications. So, I mean, it's, it's a different set of rules and standards that, that perhaps we could look at. Okay. Um, further questions for Sarah Boyack just now on this section? I think those answers have been really helpful to us. I just have one final question, and it's to ask whether you're aware of uh, examples of where having access to publicly available annual returns and accounts, including the names of beneficial owners, would have been beneficial to the sustainable development of communities. Andy. Andy Whiteman. Oh, yeah. Off the top of my head, I can't you know, think of specific examples, but I've been involved with communities and individuals for 30 years now in these matters. And in a, in a very small number of instances, obviously, but important instances, nevertheless, to those people involved, uh, the degree of frustration uh, in not being able to find out who really controls the land. Finding out who owns the land is not a problem. It's in there in the register of seasons or the land register. It may be difficult to find, but you'll get it eventually. Uh, in most instances, you'll get it quite quickly. 
you will get a name. I, I was working with a community in Ayrshire recently where we were trying to find a, the owner of a bit of land and the last deed was recorded in 1942 uh, and the owners were named at an address in uh, what was then Rhodesia. Absolutely no idea who those people are now, even if they're alive. Uh, that's a bigger problem with land registration is there's no requirement to update the register on the current you know, address and location. So it's actually not, it, the land register is designed as a place to secure property rights. It's not designed as a place to find out information on who owns land and how I can get hold of them, which is why I think we should have a much wider land information system, but that's another, that's another question. I think you yourself, the committee, were in Orkney recently hearing evidence about problems in Gills Bay, as I recall, which wasn't to do with offshore tax havens. I remember Paul Wheelhouse in evidence, I think again to your committee when he was minister, telling about his six year, six month, it might have been six year, odyssey as a community councillor trying to find out who owned a bit of land in his uh, eye mouth, as I recall, and eventually ended up as being um, a member of some ancient European royal family. So, I mean, th th these are, take it from me, these are problems that communities and individuals uh, come across on a reasonably regular basis. They don't make a big fuss about it because they frankly just give up. And that's why bringing some of this, 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 uh, some of this debate around transparency and information is absolutely fundamental and, and you know, important that Parliament makes uh, progress on it. Can I just ask a question about that? You know, is it within the competence of the Scottish Parliament to bar non-EU uh, registered entities? Uh, because Westminster has made the bill for the England and Wales situation but is the Scottish Parliament, uh, does it have those powers at the present time? In, in my view, Scottish property law is, is clearly devolved. Land registration law is part of that. And the original proposal was to make it incompetent to register title in land if it didn't meet certain criteria. And so that forms strictly part of registration law, which is part of property law, which is all devolved. Now, there may be consequential issues around uh, European treaties, Treaty of Rome, discrimination, human rights, and all the rest of it. But those are all consequential uh, potential issues. I don't think, happen to think there are any issues, but those are consequential. This is, this is wholly within devolved competence, in my view. I mean, at the moment, for example, it's my understanding, Malcolm can correct me, if you're under 16, you can't take title to land. Uh, it used to be that if you couldn't take title to land if you were a firm, that was changed in the abolition of feudal. So there's a, there's a history of saying, if you want to record a title in the registers, here are the requirements you have to fulfill. And this would merely be one other requirement. Thank you. Uh, and Malcolm Coombe. Just to, to add in the 2014 Land Reform Review Group, I'd managed to get myself into a position that I was comfortable that a restriction could operate um, on non-EU companies that wouldn't be in breach of, for example, Article 14 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which is to do with discrimination. And in terms of capital movement across the European Union, again, I was comfortable that a restriction on non-EU could work. I'm not aware of anything that's happened in the past year that changes that view. Um, to come back to Sarah's point about the um, whether or not we know of situations where our sort of offshore ownership has has caused a problem. It's actually an anecdote with, w with one of uh, Jill's colleagues, Dr. Dot Reed, tweeted recently that there's a bit of land near her that's owned by the British, uh, British Virgin Islands entities, entity, and they don't answer letters. So there you go. Uh, thank you for that. Um, as an, a final supplementary, I think, on this section from Graham Day. Yeah, thank you, Kavira. Uh, just to wrap this up, I'm trying to look at this issue from a, as objective a standpoint as you can as panellists, can anyone think of a single valid or significant reason for not having a clear requirement regarding non-EU entities as was originally proposed? Andy Whiteman. Sorry, the, que the question is, can we, can we think of... Can you think of uh, any valid reason not to do this? Not to do what? Not to have a restriction on, on the non-EU... Okay, any entities. good reason why the December yes. proposal yeah, shouldn't be... Yeah. No. Yeah. And in fact, the... The failure to include it, as I say, uh, flies in the face of progress that's being made at a UK government level and the progress that's being made at an EU level. The direction of travel globally, and this is a, this is a global concern, which is why it was raised at the, the G8 uh, summit, is a global concern with the volumes of illicit money flowing around the world. Much of it we now know is ending up 
uh, being laundered through offshore tax havens through property. Uh, I have anecdotal evidence of, uh, of dirty money coming in through the wind farm industry in Scotland. People arriving with uh, briefcases full of money. Um, this is all anecdotal. But the Metropolitan Police are very, very aware. I think it's a serious problem. Most EU countries uh, recognise it as a serious problem. So the whole direction of travel is about increasing transparency and visibility and accountability. And so we should be on that journey too. Malcolm Coombe. Um, I know there has been an argument put forward that if you were to have a non-EU non restriction, there would be a flight of these assets into EU-registered trusts or EU-incorporated trusts or EU-declared trusts. I'm not sure if I find that very convincing. Thank you for that. Uh, indeed, yes, Andy Whiteman again. Yeah. But quickly come back on that trusts thing because yeah. it is in the policy memorandum. Trust law is fully devolved. Indeed, the, land, the, law, the Scottish Law Commission have prepared a new bill on trusts. The idea that trusts are not, trusts are not as transparent as companies. The trustees are named in the land registration documents and, and in, the, in the A section of the proprietorship, um, but you can actually find the original trust deeds. The original trust deeds of any trust incorporated in Scotland are in the books of council and session. So you can even find who the original trustors, beneficiaries um, are. And you can do that across the EU as well. It's not as easy as companies, but you can find it. Why did you uh, put a evi uh, an evidence paper to the Scottish Affairs Committee in London about this very subject, you and others, um, if it was something that was competent for us to deal with? Because you were looking for the e Westminster Parliament to actually deal with the uh, closed nature of trusts and the lack of information. This, because that was to do with company law. The Small Business Employment and uh, Enterprise Act of 2015 uh, sets up a beneficial register of ownership of companies but not trusts. And we felt it was important that trusts were included in that. Still feel it's important that trusts are included in that. But the UK government refused to do that because, as the report said in March, it would take a fundamental change in UK law uh, to reveal who the owners of trusts were. In English law, because Scottish law of trust is devolved. But is it the same about revealing who trustees are well no i don't i don't know what i don't know what the law on trusts in england is or the extent of disclosure at the moment what i do know is that any trust that is set up under scots law the trust deeds almost without exception are registered in the books of council and session which is a, a dusty legal tome in the registers of scotland it's not the kind of place that you, you trip over uh, on your sort of daily travels but is, is is actually is actually there so i mean i'm not taking away from the fact that there are big challenges at a uk level the point i'm making is those challenges are slowly being addressed not as fully as i'd like um and i can't understand why we are not doing all we can to 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 uh you know to to cooperate fully with that effort. Thank you for that. Uh, we move, moving on to engaging communities in decisions relating to land, and uh, Alec Ferguson is going to lead on this. Thank you, convener. Um, slightly more mundane subject, perhaps, to, to cash loads of suitcases full of cash being brought into the country for wind farm purposes, but um, nonetheless, it's a very important one in, in relation to this bill. Uh, I don't think, and, and none of the evidence I've read or heard suggests that anybody has a major problem with the general principle of in engaging communities in decisions relating to land. But I do think um, we as a committee have a, have a bit of a, a problem with this, and I think it was highlighted <coughs> last week. Um, and it comes back to the, the, the word, two words that have been mentioned quite a lot already this morning, um, clarity and certainty, because there seems to be a considerable lack of either of those two uh, qualities surrounding this part of the bill. Um, indeed, as, as Jill Robbie has said in her written evidence, that there is little indication on what the guidance relating to this part of the bill will contain. And th th that is a real issue for me in terms of how we go about scrutinizing it. Um, indeed, uh, several of the key concepts within it are, are not properly defined, are not clearly defined. Uh, and I think that gives us all as members a, a, a bit of an issue in relation to to, to trying to drill down into the impact that this will have. But nonetheless, um, there will be a process of engaging with communities, uh, and I think it's important that we look at it as best as we can. So uh, I wonder if I could start off by asking how members of the panel feel 
that the government could ensure that the guidance, which, as I understand it, will not be mandatory, is compliant with other guidance um, on land management, and whether or not you think that sanctions should be imposed, imposed if the, or what sort of sanctions could be imposed if, if um, the, the guidance is breached. Andy Whiteman. Uh, yeah, I wel welcome this being in the in, in the bill. I think uh, guidance is useful, as you say. There's been strong, you know, widespread consensus around this. I think the points you raise about the um, lack of clarity about what should be in this guidance are good are good points. I think there could be a lot more in the bill on that. Um, but it's it's hard. You, one doesn't want to. I mean, guidance is guidance. And so beyond saying what the guidance should broadly be about, the bill can't be prescriptive about what should be in it, as it were. And we have a number of examples of statutory guidance already uh, been passed by Parliament, of which perhaps the most notable in this context is the statutory guidance on access to land under Part 1 of the Land Reform Act 2003, uh, which is very extensive in its detail, extremely extensive. Um, but as I recall, on the face of the bill itself, uh, there wasn't a great deal of detail as to what should be in the guidance, but it was clear that the guidance needed to be detailed in order to be able to effectively exercise your right to responsible access because responsibility had to be defined and therefore responsibility had to be defined in all circumstances. So I think I, I'm, I'm quite relaxed about this. I think it's a genuine concern, but I'm relatively relaxed about it because I think the guidance will be broadly supported by all parties, and therefore I think there's going to be an intent to make guidance that is as effective as possible and as detailed as possible. But I, I don't think you can get round this conundrum of the bill being clear about what should be in it and the guidance itself um, being non-statutory. Malcolm McCombe <coughs> with his own microphone. It wasn't, yeah. I think um, the classic answer is the devil will be in the detail. Um, but to go back to what Andy was saying about a different point, um, this is a step in a certain direction. And if the direction is towards more engagement, it, it's a positive step. And therefore, I'm, I'd be minded to say it's a, a good thing. OK. Alec Ferguson, yeah, go on. Uh, I, absolutely, I absolutely agree with you. The devil will be in the detail. Um, uh, and uh, I just wonder if on that basis you, you think that the guidance, when it is forthcoming, should be endorsed by Parliament, giving Parliament an opportunity to further scrutinise that guidance. Andy Whiteman. Uh, <laughs> there we are. Hello. Um, yes, I think as far as possible, all statutory um, frameworks, whether they be secondary legislation, guidance, policy, it should be endorsed by, by Parliament. Parliament should have the maximum opportunity to scrutinise these. Thank you. Um, I, I think, think we'll try and go on to the next part of what you have. Absolutely. And that leads, leads quite well on to the, 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 the next part that I wanted to explore, which is, um, OK, we have the guidance that's been scrutinised by Parliament. How do you then ensure the degree to which landowners will engage with communities? How do you... Um, in taking the, the, that consultation into account, how do you ensure that landowners um, take, the, take that consultation into account when they're making decisions relating to land? How, how, do, you, how do you follow that through in an effective way? Andy Whiteman. Well, I think this is, how do you ensure? I mean, I, I'm against legal frameworks that are trying to be overly prescriptive about people exercising their private rights. Um, and I think this bit of the bill is an attempt to move towards building up greater degree of trust between those who have the privileges and the responsibilities of owning land, but whose decisions also impact on others. Now, clearly, many people in that situation exercise those responsibilities um, 
very well at the moment and always have done. Others less so. Um, and others, going back to um, part three in the bill, we, we, or part two, we, 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 uh, we have no idea who they are, so it's difficult to assess it. But this is, in, in my view, a, a part of a, of a journey of building up trust. So I would be very reluctant, at least at the outset, at this point in time, in trying to have or prescribe you know, sanctions or means of ensuring that people do things. I would be inclined at this stage to develop robust, good quality guidance, and th 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 there's plenty, um, you know, previous material to draw on, not just in the UK, but, 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 but overseas, and, and see how it works out. Malcolm Coombe. Yeah. In sort of public law terms, I'm sure politicians and councillors will know there are plenty of times when you need to consult and uh, you need to pay attention to what people say in the consultation, but it's in terms of the response to that, if you were trying to encourage the response to absolutely, definitely take on board what was said in the engagement process, then part four would become something else. It becomes more about the sanction. It's sort of carrot and stick. What, what do you want it to be? If, if it's to be, as Andy was saying, the first step and something about sort of opening up a dialogue, then I think at this stage it's proper that you don't necessarily hit people with sanctions for non-compliance because, as I said, then the consultation becomes something else. Uh, Steve Thompson. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Um, I, th I think this is an important part, the, the guidance issue and how you, how you actually engage uh, or how you encourage landowners and communities to engage. Uh, whenever we talk about guidance, I always refer back to when I, not long after I started at, the, at, the, at what was SAC then, and there was a whole raft of, of best practice guides for community development, et cetera, that were published by the Scottish Government. Um, and I would say that they were, they were probably sitting on shelves uh, and not very many people would have um, read them or engaged with them. So best practice guidance sometimes doesn't help and it certainly doesn't mean that communities are going to be more empowered. Um, so by giving somebody guidance, uh, they've still got to take that forward and feel as if they're empowered. And we kind of feel that it, it's the, and the way the bill's kind of set out just now is it's the, the communities that are already uh, doing things are likely to be the ones that benefit the most from this those that don't have the, the natural capital or the, the, the capital base uh, to take things forward already uh, are going to get left behind. And as we call it, it's the Darwin Darwinian development in, the, in our consultation document. In terms of getting um, landowners to consult with communities, um, and it comes back to again, on, on what scale of management are we talking about here? I mean, this is the, this is the fundamental question in this part of the bill that's not answered. Um, so if somebody's, somebody's going to plant trees, they already have to consult, probably. If it's uh, over a certain size, it has to be going through the Forestry Commission. Uh, if they're going to build a house, they have to consult. They have to go through uh, uh, planning legislation, etc. If you're a tenant farmer, you already have to go to your landowner and the end, you have to go to the, the, the planning authorities and obviously now the community. Now, if it's a planning issue, there's already an opportunity for engagement with communities in that the communities get a response uh, to planning applications, etc. Uh, there are opportunities for some of these land management decisions that are going to impinge on communities. The day-to-day -day management of land should not be should not be a part of this process, mm -hmm. um, and we have to be absolutely explicit with that. Um, we can't have um, what interference with, as Andrew would say, private private matters which are of a business nature, of a daily daily business nature uh, in terms of running your business. So I think there's a, a, a real importance that we try and nail down uh, what types of management activities that we're actually talking about here. And Alec Ferguson too. Well, that, that, that again uh, leads me very neatly in, in, into the, my, my sort of last point I had on this. I, I absolutely agree with what's just been said. It's a point I put to civil servants last week when I asked them straight out, concerns that had been raised with me in my constituency, would this impact on day-to-day -day farm management decisions, basically? And we didn't get a clear answer. They have agreed to come back in writing and we'll see. But that, that is why I am keen to see more definition, because I think there is a need to, and the, the last point I wanted to put to you is, oh, well, do you think there is a need to manage expectations here to a certain extent? Um, because the, there is, uh, on one side, um, some people believe that this is going to be land managers simply telling communities 
uh, what, what they're going to do. Um, on the other side, there will be communities expecting that they are now going to be consulted on every day-to-day -day land management decision that exists. And, and that's why I believe we need more clarity, because that level of uncertainty is, is frankly not helpful to anybody at this stage. Uh, Any comments would be Comment welcome. from uh, Andy Waitman. As I said earlier, um, I think it's important to, to, to try this and just see how it goes without being too uh, prescriptive. But I do think it's that one of the most important parts of this guidance will be on the question of simply engagement, not consultation or, or, or having communities involved in day-to-day -day decisions. That would patently be you know, ridiculous, and I don't think anyone's proposing that. And if it gives any comfort to those who fear that, then I would have no problem in putting a statement on the face of the bill to the effect that this guidance doesn't relate to day-to-day -day business arrangements or, 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 or whatever. But I think one of the most important things it can do is to encourage a climate of engagement. That's just about talking. That's just about talking. It's about strategic level talking as well. It's about the future. It's about communities being entitled to a minimum level of discussion about medium and long-term plans that will impact because of the nature or character of the land or the scale of ownership or, or whatever that will impact on their own community's development. And that's a legitimate thing to do. And it's something that, you know, many landowners already do. So I think that's the most important thing. It's about engagement. It's not about consulting on the practical decisions you intend to take with respect to, you know, the future of your, you know, farming business, for example. We're going to move on to the right to buy land to further sustainable development, and Angus MacDonald's going to lead on this one. Okay, um, thanks, Convener. <coughs> um, the, the panel members from the submissions uh, you, you've already uh, provided uh, show that you're broadly in, in agreement with the, the provisions for the, the right to buy land to further sustainable development. Now, it's been stated by uh, Dr. Robbie that there's a, a need for a definition of sustainable development. Uh, and that's certainly an issue that came up uh, with the government um, bill team last week. Uh, however, the, the SRU states in their submission that uh, careful consideration will need to be given to, to whether sustainable development should be prioritised. So I'd be interested to hear the panel's views on the necessity to introduce an additional community right to buy procedure in addition to those already in place. And if in your responses, uh, you could cover how all the various right to buy mechanisms should coordinate with each other to ensure that uh, they are straightforward to understand and to implement. Uh, Jill Robbie first. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I, th I think it's very difficult just taking the kind of last part of your question first there. We now have several different types of, uh, if this is introduced, right to buy, um, each with their own separate tests and their subtleties and advising a community body on which would be the right one or the or the best one to go for i think would be very difficult especially in terms of the part a um new party of the land reform act and then this uh, new land reform bill we don't have any precedent of projects which have gone through and have been successful so i think that in increases the lack of clarity um, about the definition of sustainable development, um, there have been calls from many quarters, uh, including my submission, to define that term. Um, some say that there's no need to define it, referring to the decision in Park Crofters against the Scottish Minister for 2013, um, saying that you know this is compliant to have no it's e, um, ECHR compliant not to have a definition. But I think. In drafting a, a bill, we, our aim should not just to be uh, uh, to do the bare minimum of legality, but actually to pass clear, accessible and certain rules. Um, some also suggest it's not desirable to define the term because this then gives an opportunity for people to get around the term. Um, but I think the lack of clarity also means there's greater scope for debate about what it actually means. And some people have significantly more resources to put be behind arguing what it means. Um, and I don't think those with less resources should be, um, uh, uh, that this should have a detrimental effect on those people. This is particularly affected by section 30 of the bill where there can be an appeal to the sheriff, um, not just on a point of law, 
Um, so that in increases the potential for significant debate. I'm not convinced there's a sufficiently settled understanding of the term. Um, there was a book written about sustainable development law in the UK in 2011 by Professor Andrea Ross, and she said that the UK's approach to sustainable development has varied over time and between jurisdictions and sectors so that there's no consistent understanding of sustainable development with clear priorities and a framework for decision making that exists in the UK. So this leads to a lack of understanding on behalf of community bodies and on the part of landowners. I think certainty is a very important principle um, because it's what land is what people's livelihoods depend on, but also I think people um, don't necessarily put in effort into developing their land over a long period of time if their position of ownership is not predictable. Um, so now I think is the time, because it's used in planning and other land reform statutes, for giving more guidance as to what this term actually means. One of the worst outcomes I think that we can have is that it's so vague that it becomes just meaningless. Um, there are various materials to assist on providing more detail about what the term means on a UK international level. People like Professor Andrea Ross have been doing comparative work on how to how other jurisdictions are managing the term. Um, I think I don't think it's a solution to problems. I think it's just a forum. The term is a forum to allow concerns like social justice, environmental protection, and economic development to be balanced. And there should be transparency about how these various policy spheres are balanced. From a more substantive point of view, um, the current interpretation of sustainable development does not appear to allow the purchase of land to maintain the status quo. Um, and this appears to also prevent land for conservation purposes. Here, I don't think the balance has been sufficiently addressed in favour of environmental factors. And I think that would be one issue I would want to see clarified in the future discussion of the term. Okay. Stephen Thompson. Yes, I would just like to, uh, Jill, Jill Roby's uh, final point is, is, the, is the exact point that we were making in our submission, is that when you're dealing with a very subjective term, uh, which is sustainable development, uh, what sustainable development means to me might be different to every single member of the panel here than every member, member of the audience, because we all have our own um, weightings as to whether it's environmental focus or social or a economic focus. If it's down to a ministerial decision, then it depends really on what the uh, objectives are. Uh, and we've got to have clarity in this, and this is part of the problem we have, uh, or it's not a problem, part of the issue with the term sustainable development is it's so subjective. And what it might mean to one community, it certainly doesn't mean to another. And I remember a couple of cases in, in the community right, uh, community uh, right to buy, where it was enacted that one individual community was refused because they didn't meet the criteria of sustainable development. It would have been perhaps in their eyes, but it wasn't in the ministerial uh, eyes. It, it goes beyond sustainable development. If you, read the, if you read this section of the bill, it talks about public interest. What is public interest? Who's defining it? It goes on about significant benefit, significant harm, these, these are things that, you know, they're, they're slightly subjective in terms of how are they defined and who is going to determine whether it's of significant harm to a community that they're not getting access to that land. Uh, coming back to Jill's point uh, in terms of the, the, the existing mechanisms, and, and I think this answers part of the question, you've already got the community right to buy, and if a community has registered that right to buy, I can foresee a situation where there's all of a sudden, uh, uh, a, a, and the landowner's not wanting to sell, you can foresee a situation where perhaps the community and the landowner start falling out on issues um, and using this piece of legislation as a means to, to an end in order to, in order to try and enforce a sale. So I think we have to be very careful in how, how, we, how we deal with all of these different definitions. Malcolm Coombe and then Andy Whiteman. Um, I take on board everything that Jill said about um, the, the need for uh, a definition, but I've become comfortable with the idea of sustainable development not being defined um, over the years. So, and I think it has operated to an extent in the 2003 Act. There have been issues, as Jill mentioned, um, with regard to the sort of environmental sort of buyouts, so to speak, in terms of when someone's not seeking development. 
but to a certain extent, the argument might be that that's been caught by the new Part 3A, which allows for a community right to buy in terms of wholly or mainly abandoned or neglected land and or when it, there, there is an issue with the community's environmental well-being. So there is then an issue, I suppose, in terms of what is the Part 5 right to buy about? Is it for more community empowerment? And if, if, if that's what it's about, that's fine. Um, maybe the one way of differentiating this right from what goes before would be to move away from a sustainable development test. And that's something I've not actually addressed in my own evidence. I'm going to a bit of, bit of a wing and a prayer here, but um, it's, something, it's something to consider. Um, I, but as I say, I'm, I'm relatively comfortable with how sustainable development has functioned in the 2003 Act and what, what might come here. Um, but as I say, it's, it, the, the, what's in part five, to my mind, it's, it's reminiscent of sort of more community empowerment, which is fine if that's what the bill's about. So Malcolm Coombe and uh, Lord Gill seem to be on the same side in this particular argument. I, I'm happy with that. Good company. <laughs> Andy Whiteman. Um, right, to answer Angus's uh, question, I, um, I'm comfortable with this new power. I, I've never been a fan of the whole kind of community right to buy framing of this. I think local authorities should have been involved in this right at the beginning. I think it's very testing for communities to have to set themselves up using a corporate vehicle established for companies in the 19th century, um, although that's been relaxed somewhat in the community empowerment legislation. Uh, and in this, but nevertheless, I think we have now got a potentially very complex legal environment, um, not least of which in the in the register, where you have this register of land for sustainable development, a register of community interest in land, a register of crofting community, a register of abandoned, neglected, etc. None of which, incidentally, are integrated with the land register. So someone searching the land register will get no hint that there are these um, statutory uh, restrictions. Uh, these existing registers, the Register of Community Interest in Land, for example, is simply a register of scanned PDF documents. There's no digital mapping. Um, so I think it's now, now we've got four very distinct communities' rights to buy, or with this one, it'll add a fourth. We do need to think about how the administrative law, particularly around these rights, is, 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 is framed. Uh, and therefore, I think there should be much, much more coordination and this law should be much, much easier for communities to understand. I've worked with communities trying to use the Land Reform Act 2003. They find it difficult even to navigate that, never mind having to navigate a choice between uh, another one or another two rights to buy they might, they might have. On the sustainable development thing, I agree with uh, Malcolm. This has been adjudicated on in the courts. At the end of the day, this is a decision for Scottish ministers. Again, I don't agree that Scottish ministers should be making these decisions. It should all have been put down to the local authority level way back in 2003, but we are where we are. And I think it's really important to emphasize the fact that the, re the, the reference to sustainable development is in the context of ministers making a decision and to be satisfied in section 482A that making such a decision to grant a right to buy is, quotes, likely to further the achievement of sustainable development. Now, we can all have different definitions of sustainable development, but given you have to assess the likelihood of furthering an achievement of a nebulous concept, I think <laughs> there's no need to define sustainable development because it's wrapped up in these three massive qualifications. Um, Sarah Boyack wants a supplementary. Um, it really sparked off by that last comment. One of the, the challenges is you will have a choice of different form um, legislative options and it is a question about how that might be made straightforward for members of the public and for landowners about how the different the three acts we've currently we will have actually interplay with each other yeah I, I'm quite clear that what we should be I remember walking down Princess Street in 2005 or 6 or sometime and I saw billboards on the bus stops that said do you know about the outdoor access code it was promoting Part one of the Land Reform Act to the public. Part two was never promoted. There was never any promotional effort to go around community councils, local authorities, civil society, women's r rural voluntary service, whatever, citizens advice bureaus to say, do you know about this new right? Never any effort to do that. I think there should have been. And I think that communities should, when they're being invited to consider exercising any of these rights, sh are entitled to expect that in administrative terms, 
they should be able to say, we would like to take on this land. Which of these options would you like? Would you like a right to register? Do you think it's abandoned and you could buy it now? Do you think it meets your goals for sustainable, etc.? So it should be made much, much easier, rather than leaving communities to navigate these very complex legal frameworks and to second guess, to second guess what ministers, decisions ministers might make in each of these three circumstances, which is almost an impossible position to be, to be put into. We need to move on. Uh, we've got a final part on this, I think, just now from Angus MacDonald and Alex Ferguson wants to come in after that. Can we know, we've heard from Andy Whiteman's uh, his view on, on sustainable uh, development, um, but just, just for clarification um, and for the record, can we have a um, comment on um, the, the definition of sustainable development, public interest, sig significant benefit and significant harm, uh, and whether that should be on the face of the bill. And when considering how significant benefit or significant harm is to be interpreted, uh, interpreted uh, how will the provisions ensure that adequate consi consideration will be given to the impact on the landowner? Andy Whiteman. Uh, well, on your last question, that's part of the tests that ministers have to apply in making their uh, decision. I'm quite comfortable with the question of public interest. That's already a well-established area in law going back to the 19th century with compulsory purchase legislation, which in itself was an attempt to um, provide one legal environment for what had previously been a whole series of separate private acts acquiring land to build railways, etc. I'm not happy with the clause on harm. I think that should be removed from the bill. I think that clause, in effect, renders this power virtually meaningless. Do you have a final, p uh, Alec Ferguson? Yeah, I, I would contest. Uh, I would just contest what Andy Whiteman says that, that that the impact on the landowner is addressed in the in the four key points that communities have to meet. Because, uh, again, as we put to civil servants last week, um, it, it seems to me that if you look at those tests. Uh, and the rights that a landowner has to make representations on the impact that he believes a, a, a right to buy would have on, on the business, um, that the, the, the uh, sustainable development of the community then supersedes the case of, for sustainable development of the business. And I think that is something that we need to address as we go through this. Uh, Andy Whiteman first, and then Malcolm Coombe. That's a fair point, but in law, this is providing communities with a new right to buy and there's a decision maker who has to balance up whether the criteria on the face of the bill are met by the application and also has to uh, uh, balance that with the uh, evidence that's supplied by the owner. So that has worked to date, by and large, in the 2003 Act. Um, there's no evidence that it wouldn't work going forward with this. So, but if this, by the nature of the new right that's been granted here, were to introduce new problems, and I'm thinking particularly of the complexity of decision-making that ministers are faced with when making decisions like this, it's one thing to consent to register an interest to buy at some undefined date in the future, which, you know, by and large, doesn't make a great deal of difference now. It's quite another to be consenting to the involuntary transfer of land from a landowner to community body. So the concerns you're raising now may actually be relevant to this, but I'm not sure we can anticipate them in advance of the act being enacted and, and, and being used and exercised. Okay, uh, Malcolm Coombe to finish up this section. Yeah, just a, a very quick point. Um, and it's uh, bringing it back to the law and bringing it back to the European Convention on Human Rights. I know there's a lot more to it than the European Convention of Human Rights, but a landowner is obviously entitled to peaceful enjoyment of his or her possessions. Um, so the significant harm, the significant benefit sort of test that's added on is part of making sure that that is not disrupted in a way that would be in breach of that system. But I would also just very quickly draw another analogy with Lord President Gill in the Park case, where, for example, he said the landowner didn't necessarily have an, an expectation in the ECHR for a ballot. You know, these are things that went beyond what the ECHR necessarily required for some kind of intervention. Um, as, so provided, obviously, there is compensation, it's not arbitrary, etc. You could still get ECHR compliance, perhaps n not needing the extra tests about significant harm and significant b benefit. I'm just, as I say, there's more to it than Article 1, Protocol 1, but 
we, this might be going beyond it in terms of significant, and that's fine if that's what people want to do. And Stephen Thompson on this point. Yeah, just just to to think about this in a slightly way, the, the, the bill actually sell, it itself says is result in significant benefit to the community, or would result in significant harm to the community. It doesn't mention the landowner, so we have, we have to we have to throughout this whole bill. I think you have to think it's got to be balanced. It's got to take into account landowner and community interests. Uh, and that goes in, in uh, the tenant farming f uh, commissioner. It's not just about the tenants, it's also about the, the landowners. The, the whole thing has to be balanced, I think. And, and just the way it's worded suggests that it's in, it's in the community's favour here. Okay, um, thank you for your evidence on that. Uh, common Good Land, final part of this panel. And this is Christian Allard, who is going to lead. Thank you very much, Convener. And first of all, I would like to thank Mike Russell for uh, allowing me to come in Sky this morning. It's a fantastic day, a beautiful morning in Sky. Uh, regarding Common Good Land, the committee has received three types of evidence, written evidence. Uh, one from uh, Andy Whiteman, for example, who talks about uh, a very modest but welcome reform. Uh, but uh, maybe uh, he wants to develop on this. As the second part of written evidence, we've got some coming from uh, the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyor who had different tack on it and saying that the provision relating to common good have to be considered further with the view to exploring the possible abolition of common good property and how this might be achieved while leaving such property within the ownership of local authorities. And the third type of submission we have received is people making no comments whatsoever on the, uh, the common good land. And I would like to challenge the, the, the people who came this morning and to tell us more what kind of predominance, if any, uh, should common good lands uh, take part uh, in this legislation. So, Andy Whiteman. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, obviously, this very modest um, uh, reform is being put into this bill because it's a, an available legislative vehicle uh, to overcome what, as a consequence of the Portobello decision, was a defect that was identified in the 1973 Local Government Act, whereby uh, a local authority had the possibility of going to the courts and seeking approval to dispose of common good land, but had no avenue uh, to seek to appropriate it and use it to another use. And it seems bizarre that Parliament had intended them to be able to dispose of it, albeit with the approval of the courts, but have absolutely no legal vehicle whatsoever to appropriate it. And that seems, you know, wrong. So in a sense, this is just remedying the 1973 um, uh, Local Local Government Act on that point. On the wider point, um, there were other reforms put through in the Community Empowerment Act in terms of setting up a register. Uh, we'll see how that works out when almost every local authority in Scotland has a different definition of what they mean by common good and there is no statutory definition. I'm very clear, going back to 2005 when we produced our, our, our paper on, on common good uh, land, that this needs fundamental legal reform. This is a, an area of law that is still governed fundamentally by an act of the 15th century. Um, I take uh, extreme exception to uh, professional bodies like the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors suggesting that the oldest form of community ownership in Scotland should simply be wound up. And I think that's an incredibly arrogant view to take of a very, very important part of Scotland's um, heritage. And finally, on those who give no comment, I think that is symptomatic of the fact that this area of law is so old, so complex, and so fundamentally based on case law with very, very few statutes. There is only one statute in terms of the common good land itself, which is the 15th century, the 1973 Local Government Act, and makes provision for you know, how you transfer that and all the rest of it. Is, is, is symptomatic the fact that people are confused about this, don't feel qualified to make a comment, and that shouldn't be read as people not being interested. I now have engaged with over 100 communities around Scotland with serious concerns about common good land from all sorts of points of view over the last decade. There is huge interest in this, but there is not, uh, the, there's not sufficient uh, grasp of the detail of this. People find it just far too complicated. And perhaps many people coming to this bill were coming to this bill from a rural perspective. I'm not sure how many people came to this bill who lived in Scotland's 196 former boroughs. Malcolm Coombe. Okay, so I 
fall into the camp of someone who didn't say very much about um, common good, but that's not because I'm not interested in it, and indeed I've written about the Portobello um, litigation, and as Andy says, this is a solution in terms of sorting out the appropriation versus disposal problem, and that's fine, so as a legislative fix, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with that. Um, to make a more general point, um, yes, as Andy says, the, the regime can be quite opaque and difficult to understand, but I'm going to make a, an analogy which is probably appropriate for Sky to crofting law in terms of, I know Jim Hunter, who's been involved in various crofting bodies in the past, has be, he's been on record as sort of saying it's you, you wouldn't design a system like crofting if you were to start now, and you, you almost would want to rip it up and start again, but if you do, there is a severe danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So you've got to be very careful to, if you were to come forward and say, right, let's just abolish it, goodness me, what kind of vacuum would you be left with? Um, so yes, what's there, as Andy says, for all the reasons that he's mentioned, um, it, it, it's not necessarily very easily navigable and whatever, but I think if you were to just do away with it, that would be interesting. <laughs> I think that that interesting point, but we'll finish this particular session just now, okay? <laughs> Um, that was a very useful panel. Thank you very much for answering our questions. Um, we're going to take a five-minute break just now, and I mean five minutes. Uh, we have a much larger panel to get on the stage here, uh, so please uh, bear with us. But thank you for your attention, and we've got a five-minute break. Now, we'll restart now uh, with uh, continuing with Agenda Item 1 on Land Reform Scotland Bill. And uh, we now have a larger panel, our second panel today, which includes Sarah Jane Lang, uh, Director of Policy and Parliamentary Affairs for Scottish Land and Estates, Peter Peacock, Policy Director, Community Land Scotland, Archie Rintoul, Senior Vice Chair of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, Andrew uh, McCormick, Vice President of the National Farmers Union of Scotland, Pete Ritchie, the Executive Director of Nourish Scotland, Andrew Prendergast, the Development Officer for the Plunkett Foundation Scotland, John King, Business Development Director in the Registers of Scotland, Fiona Mandeville, Chair of the Scottish Crofting Federation, and welcome to you all on the panel. There is no need for everyone to answer each question, uh, and uh, if you just indicate to me, I'll call your name so that the sound can hear who it is. And uh, we will kick off, in fact, with uh, a fairly similar question to uh, that at the beginning of the last one. On land rights and responsibilities statement, um, you've heard the reactions of the previous panel about uh, this. Does anyone have anything in addition to add to the question about um, the, how the current provisions might be improved? Uh, should Parliament endorse this? Um, what other land use policies and strategies the uh, statement could meaningfully link with? Uh, and uh, whether updating or reviewing this every five years is likely to lead to inconsistency or instability in the property market. But, um, you know, if there are areas that you wish to comment on on this section, just indicate to me just now. Okay, Andrew. McCormick. Thank you. Uh, NFUS thinks that there should be a, an emphasis within this, a, a proper regard given to agriculture. We are the main user of land, and we need someone in there that has a, a proper definition of what we are doing on this land. We are currently exporting 1.1 billion worth of food, 5.1 billion pounds worth of uh, food and drink, and it's one of Scotland's key strategic policies is food and drink. And not to have this direct reference to the main land user is very remiss as far as we are concerned. Our members were very upset with that. Okay. Uh, Peter Peacock. <coughs> Thanks, Commissioner. Um, th first of all, we, we Community Land Scotland is very supportive of having this uh, statement. We're not entirely convinced it's the right name for it. You know, Andy Whiteman made the point about is, if this is a state, is it a statement of government? Minister's objectives, in which case, why don't we just call it that? It's a statement of Minister's objectives for land reform. If it's a statement of land rights and responsibilities, then, then it's well titled. But it's just a comparatively small point. I think that if you read the policy memorandum, it's very clear what the purpose of this bill is in a variety of regards. And it's about furthering sustainable development. It's about um, greater fairness. 
uh, greater equity, uh, it's about uh, the achievement of equalities, the, the achievement of human rights and so on. And for our money, we would quite like to see ministers when drafting this statement for consultation and for approval by Parliament, I should uh, add, that they should be required to have regard to those kind of principles. So for our uh, purposes, we would like to see that in drafting the statement, ministers should have regard to the progressive realisation of human rights as one of the outcomes of that statement uh, of, uh, sus of, of furthering sustainable development, and we'll come back to that no doubt, uh, about furthering equal the achievement of equalities uh, and also about achieving a greater diversity of ownership. And we think that would provide solid guidance for the broad framework of, of this statement because it's going to be a very important st a statement in informing the work uh, of the Land Commission, amongst many other things. As I say, I think consultation should on it should be made explicit on the face of the bill. I think uh, parliamentary approval of it would be desirable uh, for a variety of reasons that were previously discussed, uh, and perhaps reporting progress every couple of years to Parliament on the, uh, what ministers believe has been the success or otherwise of the statement in delivering against those kind of objectives. There's one other point that we wondered whether, and it's just for I leave this on the table for the committee to think about. We wondered, and indeed for the government to think about, we wondered whether there might be an additional set of provisions to allow ministers to establish national priorities in land reform for fixed periods of time so that they could say that within these broad objectives, we would actually like to see a lot of progress on this aspect and that aspect of land reform over the coming three or four year period and allow them to direct policy in that way. But I'll leave that thought with you. So, uh, Sarah Jane Lang. There um, ab about outcomes. I do think the statement should clearly set out what success looks like in terms of meeting land reform objectives. Um, I think it's it's critical for both um, clarity and certainty for all interested parties. But also, if the if the land commission is going to have a role in um, reviewing progress against the land reform um, objectives, we have to be clear as to what how su that success would be measured. Um, I, I'd concur with the comments earlier about um, the helpfulness of debates in Parliament, especially in terms of clarifying meaning and intent of the statement. And um, in terms of what else the, um, the land rights and responsibility statement should refer to, I've heard lots of comments about the land use strategy. Um, I'd like to mention the national planning framework. I think it's kind of been forgotten a little bit in terms of um, the linkages with land rights and responsibilities and also the national performance framework. My hope is that a land rights and responsibility statement or indeed a national land policy would give a framework for some kind of coherent approach to land policy in Scotland. Um, as has been mentioned, we have a number of, of competing land uses um, and it can depend on which ministerial objective you're trying to meet in terms of which one uh, take priority at a certain time. So a national land policy would give us certainty as what we're, um, in terms of what we're trying to achieve together. Supplementary from uh, Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Fiona Kavira. Uh, just just for, the purposes of for the purposes of clarity, would the panel accept that the statement should include also reference to the impact of land use so that we're clear that within the land reform agenda we, have, uh, we take cognizance of things like biodiversity and climate change. Uh, Sarah Jane Lang. I, I think that'd be a very sensible uh, approach, Convener. I, th I do think you have to look not just at the short term, but then the long term impacts of, of land use, um, especially in relation to biodiversity and climate change. So, Pete Ritchie. Uh, and with Andrew, it's about the importance of food growing in this whole debate. We do need to think of the land as our fundamental resource and that we need a long-term policy for ensuring sustainable food production. Uh -huh. And I think the land policy should underpin other things like the, the national planning framework and the regional plans, CES plan in our area is just going through at the moment. And it would be very helpful to have a, a statement of very broad, deep principles that underlie that set of legislation as well. We'd also, we've said in other evidence to things like CES plan, we'd like to see things like food belts designated around our major cities so that you have a, a very coherent approach to providing the sort of food that can be grown near cities actually to strengthen regional food economy. So a proactive approach to land use planning and land management would be great. Um, and just to add to the long list of things that the land use policy would, would want to underpin, we also have to remember the marine environment, which is obviously a, a big part of Scotland's territorial um, land and also soil in this internationally of the soil. Um, one of the things which land use policy should stipulate is the importance of soil and soil preservation and the maintenance of topsoil. And certainly Nourish would like to see a concrete tax introduced at some point so that if we do start building on topsoil and sealing it, we have to 
actually make provision for the 100 years of photosynthesis we're not going to have on that bit of ground. Fiona Mandeville. land rights and responsibilities statement. This should be and would be the benchmark that land reform aspires to. It would be a clear statement of land reform intentions and would also be a clear indication to other countries throughout the world that the Scottish Government is uh, heeding the importance of that. <coughs> we think that uh, it should include reference to increased public benefit from Scotland's land resource, more transparency of land ownership and use and the specific desire to increase the diversity and number of people managing and occupying Scotland's land through small units such as crofts, woodland crofts, small holdings and allotments. Uh, and uh, Andrew Prendergast. Yeah, I would just like to concur with what other speakers have said re regarding that the, the, the L -L LRRS should go beyond, you know, simply being a statement of ministers' objectives. And we noted that uh, the Scottish Government actually put out um, a kind of a a starting point which was a vision and the seven guiding principles for land reform in its and called it land rights in the 21st century Scotland and we thought that was you know a good starting point to to to, to start to shape a sort of a comprehensive national land policy thank you um, we'll move on to the questions about the Scottish Land Commission just now and uh, they're going to be led by Dave Thompson <coughs> thank you convener um, just to maybe put this one to bed very quickly, possibly, uh, the last panel was fairly clear on the, the view whether reform needed to be in the title of the, of the Scottish Land Commission. Uh, is that a view that people just generally accept? Isn't, it's not necessary that, uh, you know, uh, to have that word in there. Any, any particular views on that quickly? Sarah Jane Lang. I totally agree that it's not required. I mean, the Scottish Law Commission is there to review and reform um, law and it doesn't require reform in its title so I, I see no reason why the Scottish Land Commission should have reform. Uh, Fiona Mandeville. Personally, and I think my organisation thinks that reform should be in the title. <coughs> it indicates a willingness to improve and, and keep on working on, on land reform. Uh, it it's sends out the right signals I, I think. <coughs> uh, Pe Peter Peacock. Peter Peacock. All right, thanks. I thought it was being censored before I said anything. Um, the, we would be in the camp that would prefer to see the, the term reform in the title. Uh, I mean, it may be that there's not a lot in the name, but the policy memorandum makes clear that this, these set of proposals are about reform, and that this proposal itself comes from the Land Reform Review Group report, where it was clear that reform was about, and I quote, uh, measures that modify or change the arrangements governing the possession and use of land in the public interest. And therefore that uh, is about change and driving change. That's potentially very controversial over time. And I think it would be preferable if it was up front. I mean, I take the point that some have made that if, if the inclusion of reform in some way artificially narrowed the, the work uh, of the Commission, then that's a consideration. But I think as a signal of what the intention is here to drive change in our society uh, fundamentally, then it could well include the title reform in its title. Uh, Archie Rintoul. <coughs> Thanks, Convener. Um, our ICS don't believe that it's necessary to have the word reform in the title. We think what's important are, are the functions which the, the land, uh, Scottish Land Commission will have. And, uh, and the Act itself should um, set out what those functions and those responsibilities are. And it doesn't really need the word reform necessarily in there uh, in order to uh, identify what the purpose of the Commission is. Thank you. Um, Dave Thompson. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wonder in terms of the public consultation in relation to the Commission's strategic plan, the, the bill is written doesn't require any public consultation. It, it just needs to go to the minister, and, and that's it. I just wonder what the panel's views are about that. Do they feel that there needs to be public consultation? Andrew McCormick. Yeah, I think our organisation would feel that it was absolutely essential that this was out to consultation to get the broad view at what everybody involved has to do with this. We've all got to get our input, we're feed into this to make sure it's delivered properly. And I think it should eventually go through Parliament. 
It's got to have the power then at the end of it to be taken through Parliament and have the force of Parliament behind it. But the consultation is absolutely essential to get the broad depth of views from every party that's interested. Peter Peacock. Uh, Convener, we're, we're in favour of it uh, requiring to, on the face of the bill, to be required to be consulted on just to make that clear, but also not just the strategic plan, but the work programme as well. Uh, and I, we think that's important that that's on the face of the bill. Andrew Prendergast. Yeah, I'd just like to add uh, that, that, you know, we definitely think that there should be a statutory responsibility to consult widely on the Commission's work programme and their strategic plan and just pointed out it, it's slightly odd that, that Parliament must approve the selection of the six commissioners but they're not actually required then to debate uh, what it is they do in, the, in, in, in their sort of strategic plan. So we thought that uh, that's something that, that really should be looked at. Okay. Uh, Dave Thompson. Just on the, on the point of um, international land policy, which I think Community Land Scotland commented on, I, I just wonder if the panellists are of the view that the, um, the, the, the bill and, and so on could be improved with some kind of inclusion and, and a mention of the international covenant on economic, social and cultural rights. Peter Peacock. Yeah, well, uh, Commissioner, we would strongly support a number of references actually to that throughout the, the bill. That there's, a, that there's a, an important reference could go into part five, but I'll come to that uh, later. And I think too, it'd be important to make it clear that in the functions of the Commission, that they are part of their responsibility is to uh, be aware of, monitor, keep abreast of all the international uh, obligations upon us. Uh, and to therefore commission work to do that and to incur expenditure on that. And that's not clear at the moment. And I think it'd be helpful if that was done and it could perhaps be picked up in, uh, in references around what Mr. Thompson uh, suggested. Richie. Cultural rights um, is an important part of the backdrop to this, um, to this legislation. Um, and we'd like to see that implemented, incorporated into Scots law, um, because it also for us very importantly contains um, explicitly the right to food and the right to appropriate and accessible food. Um, we think that the UN voluntary guidelines on tenure that Andy Whiteman mentioned, his evidence are also part of the backdrop to this. And we think the more that this um, act is actually grounded in international law, the stronger and more robust it becomes and the better the debate we have about the fundamental principles underlying it. I do think it's really important that we, we keep moving this debate on and putting it in a wider context, um, both historically and, and internationally. Dave Thompson, to complete. Thank you, Convener. Just to move on uh, again, just wonder if panellists have a view on, on whether the LRRS, you know, um, and the strategic, strategic plan of the Commission should have a statutory link um, and, you know, should the Commission really have a requirement to integrate its work across the range of sort of land use policies and strategies and so on? Okay, Andrew McCormick. I think you need to take the whole, there's a whole lot of land users out there, we need to involve everybody in it. Uh, we're quite supportive of a great broad range of people owning land and working with land and occupying land. I think we need to pay a bit more attention to our tenant farmers and tenant crofters. These are part of what our agricultural community is, which is part of the communities that are around Scotland. So we, we certainly do need to take that into account. Okay, P Peter Peacock. Yeah, uh, one of the things that Community Land Scotland has commented on right throughout the process of the land use strategy being developed which of course itself has got a statutory basis and requires to exist by statute uh, and therefore maybe cannot formally be part of the Commission's work. I don't know about that. Uh, that would have to be explored. But one of the things we've said in a number of representations about the land use policy is that it has studiously avo avoided uh, anything to do with land reform as if you can somehow separate out land use and land reform entirely. And we just think that's a bizarre idea. And therefore the Commission, if it's to do its uh, work effectively and properly would have to have the ability to take account of all these uh, other policies and make sure that they're properly uh, integrated in any decisions that they are making and taking account of. Does that finish your points, Dave? Or just, just okay, one, yeah. One, one final point, uh, convener, about the, the range of expertise and experience that the Commission should have. 
um, you'll see that there's a list, a, a restrictive list, I suppose, uh, of experience and expertise in the bill um, in relation to the commissioners. Of course, there's a five commissioners plus the tenant farming uh, commissioner. Um, is is it necessary to list any um, you know ex relevant factors in relation to that, or does that make it too restrictive, or would it be better left? open. I mean, there's a huge variety of different things that need to be taken into account, and I mentioned Gaelic earlier on and got support, and I wonder if some of the panellists might want to comment on that again as well, but should it be kept open, in other words? Uh, is it too restrictive as it is? So, Andrew McCormick. Hey, thank you. Yeah, I, I think I stated it fairly clearly earlier on. I think agriculture has to have a, a definite presence in this we, we are the primary land users. We need to be there and seen to you because what we are delivering is not just farming. We are delivering jobs beyond that, as I explained in the food chain. We are supplying a lot of employment, a lot of infrastructure by our presence there. That information has to be available to the Commission. They have to access the right people with the right answers for that to help to make this develop and become what it should be. Sarah Jane Lang. I would like the, the list to remain unexhaustive um, because you may find that in five or ten years' time, which of course the, the, the Act will still be around then, that you need different expertise depending on where we are with, with land policy. So I would like to be able to call on expertise at that time. Um, I would echo all the calls for practitioner involvement, um, someone who has actively managed land. Um, you would expect someone on the Scottish Law Commission to have practiced law. Um, so it'd be good to have someone on the Scottish Land Commission who, whether they have managed an estate, um, a community estate, a crofter, a farmer, someone who, has, uh, a, who is a practitioner in land management. Um, for us, that would be an essential uh, criteria. Graeme Day would like a supplementary. Uh, yeah, if I may keep you on, thank you for letting me in. Uh, given the conflict which can arise between the use of land for food production and forestry and meeting our tree planting targets, if we were to have someone representing the agricultural sector, would we not, in the interest of balance, then require somebody from the forestry sector? Uh, while you're answering, um, you can perhaps take that point as well. So Peter Peacock, Archie Rinto, Fiona Mandeville, and Pete Ritchie. Peter Peacock. Well, in Graham Day's question, therein lies the dilemma of how you make it a representative body. And I think for our part that we are uh, pretty clear, in fact we're very clear, it should not seek to be a representative body because it would be impossible to be representative with five commissioners of all the interests in land. As I was, before I came here this morning, I was just thinking about this question because I thought it might arise. And I just quickly jotted down uh, 18 different interests, just literally, on, uh, as, I, as I was thinking. You know. So how would you pick to make sure it was representative? So we don't think that's the, the purpose of the commission. Uh, and this is absolutely crucial. I mean, you can, if, if you don't get this right, then the Commission will achieve nothing. And for our money in Community Land Scotland, we are not seeking sectoral representation. Let's be clear about that. And we're not seeking it for anybody else either. You should be clear about that. that but what we are after are people of stature, people of independent mind and independent thought, uh, people who have got integrity, um, who understand public policy and public policy objectives that the government are trying to achieve, who have got public interest matters that they can weigh up uh, in their mind, uh, who are analytical, who are questioning, who are challenging, rather than being seeking to be representative. And I think we, we, can, we take that position not just because we think that's the right approach to get that kind of proper consideration, dispassionate consideration of what will be very challenging issues over time, um, but also it's in recognition of the way the government has sought to structure uh, the Commission itself, which we think is not far off being pretty well right. I mean, we would like to see, entering the spirit of the short list that's there on the bill at the minute, we would like to see uh, other expertise in human rights, for example, inequalities in community development being represented in the Commission to complement that, those skills that are, that are there. But also remember that the Commission itself and its staff could employ uh, specialist expertise in the sectors, and they may regard that as an important thing to do. But also the Commission is empowered to set up subcommittees which don't only involve commissioners. 
and therefore it's entirely uh, within the powers of the Commission to access all of those 18 and many other bodies that, I, I, that I'm sure I haven't listed uh, into the discussions of the Commission in an ordered way, so you're not in any way deprived of getting that expertise, but the Commissioners themselves have got a different obligation, it seems to us, and that they should be able to sit apart from all of those um, specialist interests and competing interests very often, uh, and equally set apart from ministers uh, in making their judgments and making their recommendation, recommendations. And if we don't get that, then we would really fear for the Commission grinding to a halt very quickly and not being able to make the important recommendations they're bound to want to make over time because they couldn't reconcile competing representative interests on the Commission. Thank you for that. Um, Archie Rintoul. Thanks, Convener. I think it's um, important that we don't see the list in the draft bill as being exhaustive. Um, it's a range of potential uh, areas of expertise, but it should certainly not be exhaustive. But I think I agree with Peter that um, what's important then is that um, the commissioners ensure uh, that they consult stakeholders widely in putting together their strategic plan um, and that they use the expertise available much more widely in um, their committees, subcommittees, which they put together to ensure that they do make use of all of the expertise available and all of that expertise can feed into um, their strategic plan and the other areas which they are looking at. Fiona Mandeville. Thank you. Uh, we, we think it's important that somebody from a crofting background should be included on the Commission Crofting operates under a different set of regulation from the rest of Scotland and therefore it's important that somebody should be there from that perspective. Whether it's a practitioner, which would be ideal, or somebody with expertise in crofting law, ideally somebody with expertise in, in on land use and crofting law would be ideal, but that's probably a bit too much to hope for. <clears throat> I also wanted to say, uh, which I forgot to say in terms of whether it should be the Land Reform Commission or the Land Commission, and I said it should be Reform Commission, I think the, the concept of a land commission is smacks a bit too much of colonialism and we want to get away from that. We want to adopt the importance of land reform as the Scottish Government is working towards very commendably. Thank you. Um, Pete Ritchie. Thank you, but very briefly, um, I think this idea of a list of people who should be on it is a hostage to fortune and should be deleted. Um, everybody's going to say, why isn't my person on it? These commissioners have got to be, as Peter says, people of stature. They're responsible for the task. They're not responsible to their constituency or to their profession. They're responsible for, over a period of time, and we're talking decades, moving the land rights and responsibility statement into reality. That's their job, and they should be allowed to stick to that and not be picked on the basis of whether they're a farmer or a crofter or a surveyor or anything else. Uh, Andrew McCormick and... Uh Right, thank you. I, I was trying to emphasise the expertise that we were looking for. I was looking for a, a, a representative. It was expertise I was particularly anxious to get in there because of what we actually represent. It's the expertise of our representation that I was seeking to get in. Okay. Sarah Jane Lang, to finish this section, so we move on. Just a quick point, convener. Can I just um, stress the difference between sectoral interest and practitioner interest? Um, many, in fact, most land managers now um, require to be involved in integrated land management, and the same land manager might be dealing with forestry, farming, tourism, community, uh, woodland, all in the same pieces of land. So we're not talking about sectoral interest, we're just talking about someone who has practical experience in land management of whatever type. Uh, Peter Peacock. Yeah, sorry, come here to um, interrupt the flow of your meeting, but uh, th I think there's something missing too from the bill in relation to the Commission, and I'll, I'll flag it here, but it may come up more in, in part five as well. The, 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 the ministers have got the power to refer any matter on land to the Commission. I think that's a very good thing to have so that the debate is not ever stopped. And what was in the Land Reform Review Group report that isn't addressed in the bill is not off the agenda potentially. However, ministers don't necessarily have powers to act on all the recommendations that would come from a commission. So, for example, if uh, ministers referred to the commission, and this is entirely hypothetical, that they wanted the commission to look at a particularly large monopoly ownership in a particular area of Scotland and ask the question whether that was in the public interest or not, on the face of it, that could be referred to the commission. We would think that would be a good thing, theoretically, to allow that power to be there. 
If the Commission came back and said, actually, we don't think it is in the public interest, then there's nothing the Minister on the face of it could do about that. And for reasons I can argue later, we think that ministers, as well as communities, ought to have a power to potentially act to further sustainable development, uh, but at their own hand, not only through communities. So I think that's a, there's, a, there's a gap in the armoury there that I think you ought to uh, perhaps think about. I think we will deal with that in part five. We're looking at part three next on information about the control of land, and Sarah Boyack will lead on that. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, well, I started with the basic comment um, in the um, policy memorandum that there was a clear public desire for greater transparency. And my last set of questions to the panel to tease out um, how that might actually be delivered in the bill. Um, and I kicked off last time on the issue of EU registered entities um, not being, um, well, being required um, as an ownership criteria. So I'd like people's comments on um, the fact that it's not in the bill and what their views on uh, that omission are. Peter Peacock. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, we, we think this is really the weakest and most disappointing part of the bill, uh, for, given where we were in, in the consultation process. And listening to the, the evidence last week, uh, which I listened to online, I became much more convinced that it was weaker than even I'd thought at that time. And I think, as Andy Whiteman said today earlier, that sections 35 and 36, if you enter into the spirit of where the bill has currently got to, even taking that as a reference point, these are particularly weak uh, provisions because they're asking the, uh, the, the committee to approve a bill which give regulatory powers to empower the uh, keeper to ask certain questions, the answer to which should, might well be, I'm not giving that information and that's where the matter stops. So they're very weak uh, and at very least we want to see uh, request information to be changed to require information. But I think, Convener, the more fundamental point is that the presumption here seems to be wrong from our point of view. The presumption seems to be uh, that you can limit transparency unless you can show a reason for openness whereas our view would be you should be of entire openness unless you can show a reason for uh, secrecy. Now, I, I accept in the spirit in which I think Joe Roberts uh, mentioned earlier that there are circumstances where you should not disclose uh, an owner's ownership. For example, a woman subject to domestic abuse uh, and put on court protection orders and so on. It'd be clearly wrong to have that information in the public domain, but that can be readily argued. And so I think the presumption is wrong. Now, it, it seemed to me in listening to the evidence last week that this is the position the government have got to is, is twofold. One is that they don't think the, what the original proposal was would deliver the policy outcomes they wanted. But I don't think that's a reason for not completely delivering those, not to take the first step along that road. Uh, so I think that, that would be one thing to do. But there's also an implication at very least that, um, that, that, that owners had a particular right to, uh, to secrecy and you have to have very good reason to require openness. Uh, and that was founded, it seemed to me, in ECHR considerations. But I think the rest of us have got human rights as well. And I think that communities have got rights to know. And I, I wonder if there aren't justifications within ECHR that would balance out equally the owners, uh, the, the provision for owner secrecy uh, that seems to be driving what's lying behind uh, where the government have got to. They seem to be fearful that by requiring openness as a presumption, you're somehow breaching ECHR. Now, I don't know if that is the, d the detailed reason, but I hope the committee can probe that and can push this to the absolute limits of, uh, of testing how, how acceptable, getting back to where we are, where. This is uh, you know, a very complex area of law, I have not the slightest doubt, but I don't think we're in the right place on this right now. I'm going to bring in John King now from uh, the Registers of Scotland. Ah, thank you, Convener. Um, I think it was Jill Robbie said that there's been a, an awful lot of good progress being made in terms of property and land law over the last few years. And one of the, the aspects of that has been around transparency. So I know it's not in the face of the bill, but um, the announcement that ministers um, made last year when he invited the keeper um, of the Registers of Scotland to complete the land register in 10 years, that's a big step towards transparency. Because unless we have that top level transparency about who owns land and the extent of the land they own, it's very difficult then to drill down into different layers of transparency. In terms of the, uh, the bill, um, maybe just taking section 36, which is the, um, the provision around the keeper being able to ask for information. Um, and it's asking for people to volunteer information. And we fully take the point that, yeah, you can ask and sometimes people will say no. 
Um, from the keeper's perspective, we're not starting out from the assumption that they will all say no. Um, if this is the, the provision that goes forward, um, we see our role as being to um, inform, educate and encourage people to provide that information. And there's a bit of a, a double-edged sword here because the people that will ultimately provide the information are solicitors. Uh, it's they who make the applications on behalf of their clients. So you're dealing with a, a single group, so that's a plus point. You're dealing with a law society who we have a, a very, very positive working relationship, which is another plus point. Equally, we're all very aware solicitors have a duty to their client and there will be occasions where you know, that duty will override their, their desire to provide that information. But we certainly see it as a step forward. Where I, I do disagree with them is a comment Andy Whiteman made about seeing no value in the provision. We do see a value in the provision. Um, previously, we have asked for information on a purely voluntary basis without any statutory authority. And in fairness, we often get that information. But what we do get is the why questions. Why do you want that information? And the benefit of having something in legislation is it very strongly answers that why question. And you can point it back to, you know, this is the will of Parliament. This is why we want the information. Could I just say something on the, um, the section um, 35, the request authority? It's just it's a comment that's cr cropped up from a number of witnesses when they've been giving evidence, which there seems to be an assumption that this will be the keeper that would have this role. As far as we know, ministers have made no announcement about who um, would be the body that would be the request authority. Um, certainly the keeper's view is it should not be her. Um, the keeper's view is that her role um, is to maintain 17 public registers. It's an administrative role. Um, it's not a judicial or quasi-judicial role, whereas the request authority very much is a quasi-judicial function. Um, so we don't consider that we have either the, the resource, the, the skills, the expertise or the facilities to be the request authority. Thank you. Um, we've got several people on this. Fiona Mandeville, Sarah Jane Lang, Andrew McCormick and Archie Rintoul. Um, if you can be brief, folks, that all helps. Thank you. Fiona. I'll, <coughs> I'll be brief. I agree with everything that Peter Peacock said. And I just also wanted to say that crofters now under law have to be completely accountable. They have to, uh, their ownership has to be certified. They have to live on or near the land. They have to work the land. That should be expanded out to all owners of land in Scotland. Thank you. Uh, and uh, now uh, Sarah Jane Lang. Um, Scottish Land and Streets had, had no issues at all with the recommendation and the con uh, consultation about the, the uh, non-EU entities. But I suppose taking back to first principles as, as to why it should be included in the bill or, or not, um, I think we're still not clear as to what Part 3 is trying to achieve. If we're trying to uh, de decrease the use of offshore tax vehicles, that you'd have one um, solution. If you're actually trying to address individuals, communities' concerns about who owns a field, who the drainage ditches belong to, which aren't being cleared out, who's locked the gate, that's a completely different solution. The solution to the second one, I do think, is delivered um, in section 35. If it's the first um, problem that we are trying to, to solve here, which is um, uh, the government's, um, government's desire to decrease the use of offshore tax vehicles, I, I would like just to make a couple of comments. There's often claims made that the, the use of such a vehicle um, is linked to secrecy. Now, driving up here, I, I drove through uh, an estate which I think was listed last week um, in either The Spectator or, or another um, newspaper as one of the, the largest offshore owners uh, in Scotland. There is no secrecy about his ownership. The family has owned that, that estate for 30 years. There's big signs to the estate office. He, um, the, the owner himself has fronted uh, planning applications. And indeed, um, I think every paper uh, in Scotland carried um, a recent article about the number of helipads. The, um, that, that current owner wishes to, to use. So I, I think it's what are we trying to achieve here? If we're trying to achieve access of community and individuals um, about information, who's making land, land management decisions, I do think um, Section 35 is quite a useful tool. I think I have to ask you at this stage about the alleged 750,000 acres that are in trusts the land in Scotland that's in trusts. Yeah, I have no reason to doubt that that figure is, is inaccurate. So therefore, there might be quite a lot of land that you've driven through that wasn't, uh, the, the owners were not known, even locally, or indeed. Uh, I think ev even um, land which isn't owned in trust, convener, um, there are people who don't know who the owner is. Um, you know, an individual can buy, a I mean, I have to say there's a field 
near, near Muir and the Borders, and none of us have a clue who bought it off the f former owner, although we've tried to find out. It's, n it's not just about trust, it's, it is about um, accessibility of, of land information in Scotland. Indeed. Um, other people may come back on this, but uh, Andrew McCormick and then Archie Rintoul. Our, our members have no issue at all with transparency. It's quite a, a good thing to have it out there for that, but it, we, we have real issues with what this information is going to be used for. Going back to what uh, Jill Roby said, uh, we don't want malevolence to be a factor in these requests, and it came back to that a justifiable reason for requesting that information. Uh, what is a justifiable reason? Why are they doing it? I'm no, if we get a definition on that so people understand why they're wanting that information and the reason for wanting that information, fine, but transparency, quite happy to have it. And uh, Archie Rintoul? Thank you, Convener. RICS was certainly disappointed at how limited um, this uh, part of the bill was in its wording, uh, because we believe that um, land ownership and who controls land ultimately should be as transparent as possible and that property markets work most effectively and efficiently if the, uh, the who controls the land as well as who owns it is actually known. So we'd certainly like it to go much further than it does at the moment. Um, we also wonder why in, in section 36, if uh, the keeper has the, uh, the power to enable, informa to request information, um, why that simply isn't made compulsory. Okay, um, Graham Day has a supplementary question at the moment. Yep. Thank you, convener, uh, risking off at a slight tangent. I want to take the opportunity of having uh, Mr. King in front of us to ask, whether the Registers of Scotland has sufficient resources and is getting sufficient buy-in at the moment from landowners to believe that you can complete the register by 2024? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is, um, I mean, we're, we're very confident at this moment in time. Um, there are effectively three strands for enabling completion. There's the provisions which the Scottish Parliament brought into play um, with the Land Registration Act of 2012. So essentially that's market forces. Um, Parliament increased the number of events which would trigger registration in the land register, and we see about an additional 10,000 properties, uh, urban and rural, every year, um, which we anticipate to come on over this first calendar year, and then we'll see that's equivalent number thereafter. So that alone has a huge impact. Um, the area you're probably referring to is we're trying, we are working to encourage people to voluntarily register their, their land, and our main focus is um, with um, Scottish land and estates and with the large estates, so we're targeting effectively the top 10, top 15 large, large landowners in Scotland. Um, and I have to say we have had um, tremendous support from Scottish land and estates and from some of their members. Um, we are starting a pilot with Baclou Estates, who we believe are the, the biggest private owner um, in Scotland. I say believe because that's one of the challenges around completion. You know, you have titles on the, the old season register, as we've heard from others. It's very hard to actually be accurate about how much land is contained within one of those titles. But yeah, we're working with Baclou, um, we're working with Hopeton, um, there are various other ones who have expressed a desire to voluntarily register. Um, so you know, I'm very grateful for the work that we've carried out. Um, Pete Ritchie wants a comment on this just now, before we go back to Sarah Boyack. So I want to go back to the substantive conversation we had before in the previous panel and um, the comment that it should be competent within Scots law to restrict um, ownership of land in Scotland title to entities that register in the EU. And we just have to keep going back to why is that important? And I think it's because transparency and openness um, mean that it's more likely that land is being used for its primary purpose of producing food, supporting biodiversity, underpinning economic development, um, and generally not being used for tax avoidance and speculation. So I think I would, Norris would certainly encourage the committee to have another look at this and see whether those, that section of the bill couldn't be strengthened significantly. Thank you. Back to Sarah Boyack for part of the question. Thank, Thank you. you. Have been very useful to us. I want to tease out the issue about um, the power to request information versus the power to require an answer and what the sanctions might be. Um, the minute I started asking what the sanctions might be in the last panel, we got lots of people saying don't go there. So, is it actually having the right legal requirement on the face of the bill um, to require answers that will then enable that transparency um, and that information to be delivered?
It's been suggested that the, it's too weak in the bill at the moment, so there are a number of suggestions as to how to remedy that. But without without changing that, we're not going to deliver the transparency, which is the objective of the bill. Is that would that be the views of the panel? Uh, John King. I can't really answer that by analogy, but the way in which land registration works is there are a number of questions on the application form, and effectively, unless all the relevant ones are answered, the application won't be accepted by the keeper. So what that means is an individual or a company can't acquire their, their right in the property. Um, so I mean, if there was to be, I mean, I guess for not just an issue like this, but any real issue which involves the keeper making a determination about whether an application is acceptable or not, the sanction, you know, generally always has to be, sorry, but you can't get your application onto the land register. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful to have clarified. The last question I want to tease out, it's been suggested by a couple of the witnesses in writing and here today about this idea about whether it's appropriate to ask the question and what the motives are behind asking the question. And I think uh, Dr. Jill Robbie suggested that the, the issue of somebody's signature, for example, being used online, is there a common sense way to do that so that people's information is out there without necessarily every dot and comma of their personal details then being used in a way that is not appropriate? John King again, yes. Um, it's interesting, if we, if we go back to, um, if we go back to, in Scotland had, the, well has, the world's oldest public um, property register, which is a great achievement, the Register of Seasons, and it was introduced in 1617 to prevent fraud, because it took the view that actually there's less scope for fraud if you have more transparency. So it's interesting again that you know, we're having the, the debate today. In terms of having access to documents and information, it's always been there in Scotland. Um, property deeds are publicly available. I mean, technology, the argument, I guess, is that it makes them even more readily available. Um, but I, I guess the way in which land registration works, it's not all predicated on a signature. Um, it's predicated on who the, the person is who walks into a solicitor's office. So, I mean, there's obligations on solicitors to you know, determine, you know, well, to know their client. Um, it's for solicitors to certify that information when they're submitting their application for registration. So there's a whole layer of protection which goes, al you know, uh, which is associated with a property transfer. Um, so there's a big role for um, the solicitor community in that. Um, I'm not sure that, you know, having access to, to information makes the risk of fraud even more prevalent. Okay, and just as a quick, a quick supplementary. So to clarify, if somebody um, does not give you the information they're not deemed to have registered the land. So if a community wants to know who owns the land, um, at that point there's no registered person or organisation owning the land. So does that then make it automatically open to the right to buy under the terms of this legislation? I mean, the position would be that if um, somebody has transacted to buy land and there's um, a defect with their application, they can't get their application on, but what either the land register or the seizing register would show would be the, the existing or the previous proprietor, they would still be listed as the, the owner in terms of the register. Okay, thank you. In line. Um, going back to um, Sarah Boyack's first question, I was just trying to find the, the relevant section within the Act. Um, my understanding is that sanctions can be imposed, that the power, um, regulation-making powers allow for civil and crim uh, criminal penalty, uh, penalties for failure to comply with the regulations, for example, failing to comply with a request for information without good reasons. So it would appear that a sanction is already in the, the face of the bill. And on your second point about um, information being made public, one of the questions we asked was about how multiple requests um, would be dealt with, because what you don't want to have is a, a very onerous system where information is requested, but it's not then put in the public domain, and someone, the, the next door neighbour comes and asks for the information, then the next door neighbour. So I think we need to look at um, how, we, how we put the information that comes um, as a result of a request into the public domain so that others can then use that at the appropriate time. Okay. Fine, thank you for that, that section. Um, we're moving on to engaging communities in decisions relating to land, and Alec Ferguson's leading on this one. Well, thank, you. Um, thank you, convener, and um, I don't need to do a lot of preamble because I'm sure members of the panel will have heard the discussion on the previous panel, um, and we don't really need to sort of rehearse a lot of those arguments again, but um, you, you will appreciate that concerns have been raised about the lack of detail about the guidance at the moment, but g given if we accept that that concern exists, I just wondered if anybody's got anything to add to what they heard, particularly in relation to um, how the government could ensure that the guidance is compliant with 
um, other guidance that already exists on, on land management, um, and indeed on whether the guidance on engaging communities in decisions should be endorsed by Parliament, which I think is probably a general view that it should be, um, to allow it to be further scrutinized. But also, um, and I know there is a variation of opinion on, on amongst the panel members on this, whether uh, a, a carrot or stick approach should be engaged with um, where either party is reluctant to enter the process that's been uh, developed under the guidance. So if anybody's got anything to comment on those sort of three issues, I'd be grateful. Okay, any comments on that? Sarah Jane Lang. Scottish Land and Estates um, recognises the need for um, significant improvement in terms of engagement between landowners, businesses and communities. So um, we, we are, we're supportive of anything which um, increases um, the opportunities for, for communities and, and landers to work together. I think we're less concerned uh, um, ab about the, um, the detail not being on the face of the bill because we have experience of, of working with the National Standards Community Engagement and, and others. So I think you already have guidance out there which is about proportionate um, approaches to community engagement. I think my, Mr Russell um, and possibly somebody else talked about engagement can't just be telling people well, it can't be, but it can be informing people in certain situations. It can just be informing them when you're going to en en engage in certain land management practices. Um, engagement, you're quite right, is a two-way process. It's not just one person who engages. And I think if you're going to look at, at, at sanctions, um, you have to then look at situations where communities don't want to engage. I think lots of land managers um, across Scotland have had the experience of sitting in drafty village halls, waiting for someone to come and speak to them about their forestry strategy. Um, and what then happens if no one has come to speak to you and you have a, showed a willingness to, uh, to engage? What we're trying to he achieve here, though, is, is attitudinal change, behavioural change. It's about building trust. And I think the more prescriptive you are, um, the less likely you are to, to achieve that situation that we're, we're, we're trying to deliver here, um, which is about dialogue. It's about people working together to deliver um, a shared vision. Uh, Andrew McCormick. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our members are... Uh, well, this guidance has got to be something that can be referred to and made use of, and we think there should be something fairly robust and in place in there for our members to know what the guidance is. And to do that, we think you should be engaging with the communities and all stakeholders involved with the land to get a proper set of guidance, because it will come down to a stage where there will be a failure to comply with guidance, and if we don't know what that means, the guidance has not done the job properly. So you need to have something there to allow people to be aware what failure is. Okay. And Peter Peacock. Thanks, Convener. Um, to be frank about it, we're pretty lukewarm about this proposal. It's very difficult to be against it. But um, for us, it's not about land reform. It's about land management, and we're interested in change. But so that's a, a fundamental point. However, I thought also Alec Ferguson, the more he spoke today, was uh, you know opening up some really interesting and, and pertinent points about the difficulty of the lack of clarity about this. Now, for our part, it, given that this is here uh, and it's going to remain here, I'm quite sure about that, you've got to try and make it work. I think that it seems quite weak to us in the sense that you could engage and, and ignore with great ease. And that raises the question about sanctions and about compliance that Alec Ferguson raised. And I guess that, um, well, before I answer that point, the other point I just wanted to be quite clear about is that if, if this is to exist, it cannot be about operational decisions day by day. That would just be hopeless for the community. It would be hopeless for the owner. Uh, so it has to be about strategic land use, long-term land use planning, rather like a local plan but at a state level if you're thinking about a, a large estate. Uh, and I think, like Sarah Jane, that the, the way that the Scottish Government officials were beginning to flesh out to the committee last week what they envisaged by way of a, a consultation process and stakeholder engagement in developing the guidance, I would be pretty relaxed about meeting some of the requirements that Alec Ferguson has highlighted, because the interest around the table will be seeking to meet those interests. So I'd, I'm, I wouldn't be uh, unhappy about that. On the co part about compliance, I suppose that technically, in the policy memorandum, certainly, the officials, uh, or the government, I should say, rather, um, argue that it is I if, if an owner did not seriously engage according to the guidance, whatever that ultimately says, and for our part, we would like to go further than just engagement, but actually the purpose should be to engage and seek to get a consensus and an agreement about the long-term land use plan to give a bit more um, power to the whole thing. But if they fail to uh, engage at all, it is a factor 
that ministers could take account of when they had an application to buy under part five, but it's only one factor they may take account of given that the owner was showing no interest in engaging with the community, for example. But the converse is also true. And that is, that, and this is a danger in it, I think, that, that if owners simply do this to tick the box of having done it so that they can defend against any future application to purchase, it would work in that way too. So I think there are some things to be further teased out, but I think the kind of, if you can get to the bottom of the kind of questions that Alec Ferguson uh, was raising earlier particularly, and I think some of the p answers to that have come out in this panel, then I think it, it, it would be good to get that further development of the thinking. So um, I'm Archie Rintoul and Pete Ritchie, and back to Alec Ferguson if there's any other points. So, Archie Rintoul. Thanks, Convener. At RISA, certainly I welcome the, the provisions for guidance on community consultation, uh, and we're very happy with that. Um, and I, we agree, I would agree with much of what Peter has said. Just on the issue of sanctions, we think it has to be absolutely clear what the sanctions will be and how they will be used. Uh, I think the, the policy mem memorandum uh, suggests a number of areas where uh, sanctions might become, might be involved and how they might be used. But we think there needs to be a greater clarity on that. Uh, we think land landowners involved really need to be absolutely clear what they must do and what will happen if they do not do this. Uh, um, Pete Ritchie. Um, yes, I, I mean, in general, Nourish welcomes this um, proposal. I think if we're going to seriously talk about um, land being managed in the public interest and for the common good, then this process of engagement is part of a dialogue about trying to figure out, well, what is that? We have to have those sorts of conversations. I agree it may or may not lead to people buying bits of land, but it may well lead to land being managed more in the public interest and for the common good. And just, But I do think there needs to be, as, um, as Andrew says, clarity about what goes with that engagement. We certainly had experience locally of a forestry company, forest owned by somebody else, managed by another forestry company, 30-year replanting cycle, to get their gold star for something, they have to supposedly engage with the community. They send us their plan. People get together. They say, here's 19 things we'd like to be able to do in terms of having paths through the forest when you replant, dead silence. And I think there is that sense sometimes that you think, well, what was that about then? So I, I do think over time those standards need to be linked in some way to saying, if you want to get this gold star or if you want to get permission to do this or if you want to, to, um, to get a grant for that, you, you do have to show that you've done this. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think even if people do it because it's a way of, of getting other things they want to do, that whole business about engaging with communities to discuss what's in the public interest and what's for the common good, I think is progress. So Alec Ferguson, is there any points that need to be followed up? I, I, I would just like to follow up one little bit on, on that's come out of that and, and um, really that all, all the contributors have, have raised, which is a, a point I didn't bring up in the, in the last discussion. But it, it's whether I, I, Peter Peacock talked about a tick box exercise, and of course the, 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 the sort of what he's really referring to is somebody who goes through the process, um, ticks the boxes, and then totally ignores the, the product of the discussion and does what he or she wanted to do in the first place. Um, uh, and I can see the temptation that's in there. Do you, I mean, do, the, my question is, do, do you see a role for the Land Commission in, 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 in this part of the procedure? Or does anybody? Uh, well, on, on, uh, I haven't really thought about that, so I, I need to think about that a bit further. But the, in our evidence, our written evidence, we made the point that we thought the Land Commission, amongst its functions, should have the power to uh, both assist with the creation of, but also, if necessary, create codes of practice and codes of good guidance around land questions. And to that extent, they may well have a role uh, in, in this. But, uh, but given, the, the, given the process the government are, going to pr are proposing to go through in relation to creating what will be guidan a guidance requirement upon them, maybe the Commission would not need to be involved to that level of detail. But I, don't, I, I really would not think further about that. That's the only current connection I can see between the Commission and, and that is about codes of practice, codes of guidance to further develop these. Fiona Mandeville, please. Sorry. I don't have an answer to how, <coughs> excuse me, how sanctions might be made or how all this that we've just been discussing can be implemented, but I would just point out the results of it, of community engagements, when you look at Croft and Community Trusts and the developments, the very beneficial developments that have ensued in so many of these Croft and Community Trusts. And so that basically shows the importance of achieving engagement with, with communities. And Andrew Prendergast. 
Yeah, I'd just like to echo that point is that, you know, we, we've been talking as though there's a sort of a combative thing going on here between sort of land managers and communities, but very often land managers, landowners have an awful lot to gain from that positive engagement and it can be uh, around reputation and the, and the community's attitude to them and they may not actually have to do very much to get an awful lot of uh, positive uh, points from uh, engaging with, with the community. Alec Ferguson. Uh, I just to, just perhaps to finish off, convener, I, I accept that absolutely. But in any process like this, um, there will inevitably be the odd occasion where there will be a combative element to it. And where you have that, you are going to need some sort of arbitration or mediation, me, mediation process. Um, the, the, the Land Commission may not be the right uh, vehicle, but I think that's something we need to think about as we take the bill forward. Thank you, convener. Very useful. I think we'll try to move on to part five now on the right to buy land to further sustainable development. Angus MacDonald to lead. Okay, thanks, uh, convener. Um, following on from the discussion with the first panel, um, I'd be keen to hear the, the, uh, this panel's views on, on whether it's necessary to introduce an additional community right to buy procedure in addition to those already in place. Uh, and if it is necessary, how should all the various right to buy mechanisms coordinate with each other to ensure they are straightforward to understand and implement? Okay. Andrew Prendergast, to start off. Yeah, I, I would uh, just like to say, you know, we certainly welcome this new right to buy and, and I do feel that it actually fills a gap between what has hitherto been uh, in the existing community right to buy legislation now extended through the Community Empowerment Act um, and the existing, pre-existing uh, compulsory purchase powers that were open to certain public bodies, but in actual fact were, were, were very rarely used. Um, but we do obviously note that uh, the extent to which communities are going to be able to um, unlock the benefits from these provisions are going to depend on their capacity to implement what remains a very complex uh, area that's now s um, divided between different pieces of legislation and other commentators earlier made reference to the fact that that will depend on communities' uh, social capital and, and their capability and that needs to be supported um, so that communities that are maybe less able to access the provisions in, in this bill and other legislation are able to do so. Okay, uh, Peter Peacock. Thanks, I was saying to Mr. Ferguson at the comfort break that I, I keep getting this feeling of deja vu again about this because this is exactly the position we were arguing in relation to the Community Empowerment Bill we wanted to get the committee to and it's been quite evident that f the result of the interaction between the committee and government uh, has helped them clarify the proposals to allow this now to come forward at, the, at this bill. So we're very happy to see this. It, we think it's just a further uh, step forward. It's a further uh, set of considerations a community can take into account in deciding how they want to move forward. And it's also based on a more positive forward-looking notion about the opportunity of land and the opportunity for further sustainable development and not just combating neglect or um, uh, dereliction uh, or whatever and, and harm in that sense so we, we welcome it generally there's a few things we think you could do to tighten it up uh, in terms of we think some of the hurdles to get over are really quite high for communities the question of harm that uh, was referred to in the previous panel could be modified or indeed removed as Andy Whiteman said although I think it's probably there for a very particular legal reason I think too that the demonstrating that the community's proposal is the only way to do something is almost impossible to show and therefore again I think there are things you could do to, to tweak and adjust that. I think on the, uh, on, on the specific questions asked um, the, about how do you coordinate between all these now different uh, approaches and there was a lot of discussion about that at the last panel. Uh, and we, you know, we're, our organisation is working with communities and aspirant communities for purchase all the time. Uh, and you may not be aware or you may be aware that there's a short life working group that the Scottish Government have got working right now, which is looking at how you put in place the support mechanisms to allow the uh, one million uh, acre target for community ownership to be realised. And both Sarah Jean Lang and I are both sitting on that. Now, it has not concluded its work and I cannot tell you what it's going to recommend because it's not agreed that yet. But I can, I'm sure, with confidence tell you that there's been a lot of discussion in that group about how you promote awareness of all the different pieces of legislation that now exist, how you, because there's huge ignorance about that, even amongst professionals in the land sector, let alone amongst communities. We don't think this is impossible to deal with. There, we now have got a very clear suite of things, are very complex at one level, but we're quite confident it can be simplified. So that short life working group is going to make recommendations to the government. I'm pretty confident they will say 
things about the need to promote more awareness of this, but also to put in place the support arrangements that can allow communities to exercise uh, a much higher degree of understanding in lay terms of what, the, of what the law now provides and choose the avenue they want to choose to go down that best suits their circumstances to use the law, if indeed that's the route that they want to go down to use the law. So I'm quite sure that in the course of time you're going to see a huge amount more uh, emphasis on both promotion, awareness and support to communities to allow them uh, to exercise the new rights that are now there. Because as, other, as people have said, that it is a complex landscape. However, you know, communities have learned to live with this complex landscape and they've learned to make it work. And there are people there who do completely understand it. Uh, I'm not one of them, but there are people there who do completely understand it and, and who can help uh, navigate with communities through all the complexity of the law. But there is a task to be done in better uh, presenting that in lay terms, but that's underway, I would argue. Goodness, it's not like the Schleswig Holstein question that there are people who actually understand it. I'm not going to have that. Uh, Sarah Jane Lang. Um, I would agree in part with, with what Peter Peacock just said. Um, I, I do think there's a need to inform um, people and raise awareness of the roots of addressing barriers to sustainable development. But of course, we're aware that those barriers aren't just linked to ownership. There's lots of things going on um, in terms of involving people in, in planning. And although we get a little bit hung up on the Community Empowerment um, Act's provisions in relation to neglected abandoned, there are also provisions in there about locality planning, which I do think will be quite instrumental in helping um, communities um, work with landowners and businesses to address sustainable development barriers um, in, the, in their area. Um, I would like to point out though that when we, when we were discussing the, or going through the passage of the bill, Peter's referred to a few of the discussions which took place and the Minister said at the time that landowners needed certainty as to the scope of the land which would be affected um, by the, the provisions. I don't think that there is certainty. If you look out your window um, today as a land manager, you should be able to tell which areas of land are neglected or abandoned and they would be privy to the provisions contained within the Community Empowerment Act. If you're looking out your, your, your window, you could be very happy with the way your land is managed. You could be um, quite happy with the, the, the yield that your, your barley field is going to give you. But the reality is that that property, that, that field, could be subject to these provisions. Um, these powers apply to land which is occupied, which is properly and well managed. Um, and it seems to me clearly at odds with the Scottish Government's assertion that good landers have nothing to, to fear from the Land Reform Bill. Um, however, I, I do think that there are situations where you do need to address barriers to sustainable development um, across Scotland. I'm just not sure that this is a provision to do it. A um, couple more comments on this. Uh, Pete Ritchie and Andrew McCormick. Pete Ritchie. Okay, um, I really just echo, I think, some of Sarah Jane's points about the complexity of this. And this is just born out of experience of being part of a community group, um, using the right to buy to try and get hold of a derelict steading, which is, in our view, neglected and abandoned and an eyesore, and ending up losing in the courts over the right to buy and having to go back to square one. We now look at this provision and think whether that's going to add another choice to go down. It is. You know, it's certainly a good idea that there should be a, a power to purchase land compulsorily when it's, it's clearly not being used in the best interest of sustainable development. But I have to say, we'd certainly feel from Nourish's point of view that it's time local authorities had a stronger role in land management and land acquisition in their localities. We do feel they have a better understanding of local needs and local circumstances. And us having to go to Scottish ministers to argue for a derelict steading to be used for affordable rural housing just seems a bit it's disproportionate. Um, it ought to be able to be sorted out locally. So we, generally, we'd like to see local authorities take a, lot, a stronger role in land ownership, land management, land acquisition. Um, and it's a sort of, not a, I suppose it's not a specific comment on this clause, but it's saying that should be part of the direction of travel of land reform. Andrew McCormick. Uh, thank you. Uh, our members, oddly enough, have quite a lot of worries about some of this uh, right to buy, as we, uh, communities have. First of all, the definition of a community. That really is something we have issues with because it's possibly a postcode. It could be how long has the person been in that community? Is it a, a residency involved with the people that are taking part in these decisions? Who is it that ultimately makes a decision? And who is it that ultimately gives the answer to that decision? All of these things are coming in. There's, there's four key tests in there. These four key tests seem to be skewed towards the community. 
We would like to see the, a balance in there for the, the landowner, land occupier. We keep having to refer to land occupier because they are equally, if there's a tenant farmer there, they are equally as involved in these decisions. We'd like to see them involved in this, being a big part of what these decisions are. Is there a place in here for a lease rather than a sale? Would that not be a better community thing to have where there would be engagement between this community, whoever it is? Would that be a possibility? We see it working with turbines. There's benefits to be achieved by farmers leasing land for a community benefit. So that is something that needs to be taken account of. There's also a, a, a big worry we have with this third party involvement with some of these communities. There's people could be brought in here to fund, I would assume it is to fund a community plan or a community development. We have to be very, very careful about who these third parties are because if they're out there to make a development gain on this, is that really in the benefit of the community? Because it, they could be using a community for their own benefit. So that, that is a real worry to a lot of our members. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, okay, I think we get that point. Thank you. Uh, Fiona Mandeville and Archie Rintoul. One, one of the most basic uh, definitions, perhaps, or interpretations of sustainable uh, development would be restoring communities to land that they once lived in and were cleared from. And I'm thinking of the, the Straths of Sutherland, for example. And it would be a real good aim of this bill if it could find a way to help com communities, help people come back living in these glens again. This would strengthen local communities. It would open up more schools and local infrastructure. And we would, of course, argue that any new uh, holdings in these glens would be uh, under crofting tenure. Crofting's held to be the role model for small-scale um, communities and development throughout Scotland and well beyond. Thank you. Um, Archie Rinto. Thank you, convener. I think RISS would um, agree that there is a gap there which potentially could be filled by this provision. Um, further than that, I think the organisation for which I work in my day job uh, carries out the valuations under the 2003 um, Act um, for the Scottish Government. And certainly one of the things which we have been struck by is the difficulty which communities have uh, in finding their way through the legislation um, in order to actually acquire that land. Um, and I appreciate what Peter says, that there are organisations like his which can give guidance. Um, but um, it's still a significant hurdle, I think, for a lot of communities who perhaps don't even get as far as Peter's body if they're thinking about it because they have a look at it and think, well, this is really very difficult. And I suspect that um, the provisions here do mirror those in the 2003 Act and the, the changes made in the uh, Community Empowerment Act. And uh, that's fine, and at least the provisions are pretty well the same. But I think it will still be the case that they will still be difficult for a lot of communities to find their way through. And I think we've, the Scottish Government really will have to ensure that um, it monitors it very clearly. And it may very well be that it's this difficulty which is really responsible for the fact that there are relatively few transfers have taken place since the 2003 Act. Okay, um, I think, uh, Angus, do you have, uh, in a moment, Andrew, do you have any more points that you need to put on your, uh, th this part? Yeah, just, uh, One more? Just one small point. Right, uh, convener, um, Peter Peacock uh, has already touched on this earlier. Uh, however, just for the record, um, it should consideration be given to providing for a direct power of, a, of ministerial intervention to buy land to further sustainable development if there's no community present. Peter <coughs> Peacock. Thanks, Camilla. Uh, um, th this is one of the things where we think there's a gap uh, in the armory that's being provided by the bill, um, and it partly relates to the point that Fiona Mandeville's just made. Uh, I mean, the, the only way in which these powers can be used is if a community initiates the action themselves. And we know from our experience that not every community either wants to do that, but they may still have concerns about their place and the land use. Some don't simply have the capacity to do it. Uh, they don't have the strength to do it at that particular time. Uh, but of course, there are not communities everywhere. I mean, people driving here today have, uh, have commented on driving here today or yesterday, and you're driving through vast tracts of land which once supported thousands of people. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they're not there, and therefore there's no community to exercise the new community right to buy, by definition. 
Now, we would like to think that, again, ministers should have the power independently of communities wanting to in in initiate that. I mean, at one level, it's very complementary to communities, but it's not the whole answer. So we think they should have powers, and it's partly in relation to the point Fiona Mandeville's made that uh, there ought to be the opportunity for the resettlement of land that was once cleared, or indeed uh, just the settlement of land uh, over time, and it's not always going to be possible for a community to do that. So we think as part of the armory, uh, the government should also be thinking uh, about ministers having direct powers themselves to further sustainable development. I mean, I would be really keen to answer some of the points about sustainable development that were made in the earlier panel if you want, but no, I'll leave that just now. Um, you, you can do in a moment. Um, we're trying to uh, get as much out of this as possible, and uh, we have the stamina. I hope the uh, audience have the stamina as well, because uh, it is a complex matter, and it's important to get as wide an effort, uh, uh, an exercise of this, so that we can get the points of view to review it in due course. Uh, Andrew Prendergast, first of all, though. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to um, come on a couple of points. One was was. Um, maybe touches on that issue around um, you know what what represents sustainable development. There was discussion earlier about um, you know needing to get clarity over what is sustainable. I just wanted to make the point that um, you know communities acquiring assets, acquiring land, it's actually it's a quite a hard route to go down, and it's not something you do lightly or flippantly. Um, and the communities who do that do it because they recognise there's a very strong. Uh, development need and so the idea that they might look at somebody's barley field and go oh, well actually we could do something better with that is unlikely to arise because most communities are very happy if the land has been used productively and usefully it's only when it's quite clearly not being uh, that they would actually go down the difficult route of trying to acquire and then then run a business themselves and the other thing is is just um, on on that issue about whether you know ministers getting involved we thought it would be Plunkett Foundation for it be useful if if ministers were to have regard to the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights when getting involved in the same way that, um, when considering an application, in the same way that they already do with the community right to buy uh, applications under the existing land reform and, and community empowerment. Thank you. Peter Peacock, you, can you put on the record briefly yeah, about, I, I was just about sustainable I, I, development? I've been listening to these arguments about sustainable development now for, you know, both, well, for quite a long number of years, actually, but also particularly in the last week and, and this week again in relation to this bill. And I'm afraid I just do not buy the arguments that this is vague and undefined. Uh, if you go into looking at the concept of sustainable development, just Google it and you'll spend the rest of your month reading up on what is really a developed concept. It's not a vague concept uh, at all, in, in our view. And I'm sure that's what allowed Lord Gill in the court uh, to say that uh, when challenged that the concept was so vague as not to constitute law, he said that he didn't agree with that. It was a term in common parlance uh, and it was uh, readily understood by lawmakers and the courts and so on. And, uh, and we think that there's real strength in what he said in that. But I think we've got to be careful to distinguish what's on the face of the bill and what exists beyond the bill by established government policy. And, you know, there's lots of pieces of Scottish legislation that have now got the term sustainable development in it, and it's nowhere defined on the face of the bill, to the best of my knowledge. In all the land reform legislation we've been touching on today, a community body to reform itself must demonstrate it is furthering sustainable development, not defined. Uh, in parts two, parts three, part three A of the Land Reform Act, the term sustainable development is repeatedly used. Ministers have to have regard to it in weighing up their decisions. It is nowhere defined. Uh, and Parliament, as recently as June of this year, approved a, a, an act of Parliament which came through this committee, where again sustainable development made an entry onto the statute book and it wasn't defined. So I don't see why now, particularly in this Act of Parliament, we must find a definition on the face of the bill. So I, 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 like Malcolm Coombe, I think that the, the bill as it stands in that regard is, is, is perfectly um, uh, valid and helpful that it's not actually defined. However, go beyond the bill, there are loads of established government policies and policy documents at both a UK and a Scottish level which set out much more thinking about sustainable development. So there are parliamentary questions that have been answered by ministers which set out the various positions. Sustainable development is referred to in statutory planning guidance. It's in the National Marine Plan and so on and so forth. Uh, and also a lot of those documents route back to the UK shared framework for sustainable development 
which was approved in 2005, signed up to by the UK government and the devolved administrations in the UK, and that begins to set out in more detail. So I think the, the, the key is not to worry about what's on the face of the bill <coughs> in terms of sustainable development, it's to point people to what sits beyond the bill where this is all very carefully rehearsed uh, and developed. And as the court has said, they actually don't see a particular problem with it. If they don't have a problem with it, because they're ultimately there to determine uh, the outcome and adjudicate on, on challenges to this act, I'm not sure why Community Land Scotland would have a problem with it. Thank you for that. I'm trying to make sure that everyone gets a say, but I'm also conscious of the time. So, uh, Andrew McCormick, um, Alec Ferguson, was it, or was it? No, it wasn't. So it was Pete Ritchie who wanted to come in, and uh, also Archie Rintoul. And we'd like to bring this particular section to a close. So, Pete, so um, Andrew McCormick first. Uh, uh, Will I shout? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think uh, you actually contradicted yourself there, Peter, because you said, oh, well, probably not, but it doesn't matter. You actually said you could spend a month on it. This is the issue that the, our members have. It's the vagueness of it. You, there's nothing there defining it precisely. There are interpretations of it, but it's the fact that it's got a month's worth of reading on Google. It's the one thing everybody will then interpret to what they want to mean out of sustainable development. They'll take it from that. And how do we take that forward? We need to get something that we can say, okay, this is a sustainable development and we can work with that. Understand it, get both parties, your community, your landowner, land occupier, to get to understand it. It's purely open to interpretation. And that is, that's where our issue is. If we can see something that we can actually pin down and know what we're dealing with, we'll get there. Right. We hear that point of view. Pete Ritchie and then Archie Rintoul. Okay, just at the risk of repeating myself, I'm just concerned that we keep hopping over local government as the mechanism for compulsory purchase and for proactively doing the sorts of things you talked about, Fiona. I think if you want to repopulate the Strath, it's for the local authority to think as part of its community planning process, which has just been reviewed and renewed, as part of the democratic renewal we're promised for the next parliament. It's for local authority to say, what's our local economic development plan? What's our local spatial plan? How are we going to repopulate those glens? And if that means we go in and we buy some land and, and make some new crops, let's do that. But it seems strange to hop over the statutory bodies who actually have planning responsibilities, economic planning responsibilities, community participation responsibilities, and go straight to Scottish ministers. So I just think we need to, to, to redress the role of local authorities there. Uh, Archie Rintoul. Thank you, Convener. Um, I think one of the difficulties with looking at Lord Gill's uh, statement in the, the Park case was that that was made in a specific legal context for that case. And it needn't necessarily translate into other legal contexts with this bill. So I think a word of warning there about that. Um, I think one of the difficulties is that, yes, there are definitions of sustainable development. Um, the, uh, the policy memorandum here contains um, one which was made by Lord Sewell in the Sewell Commission. Um, there's also a, a definition in the Local Government in Scotland Act 2003. Um, there's a Brundtland definition which is widely used. Um, there are various definitions. It's not undefined, but there are various differing definitions uh, in one way or another. Uh, so I think it really needs to be absolutely clear um, what definition of sustainable development the Scottish Government are using in these circumstances in this particular context. And if that's not going to be in the Act itself, I think it very clearly needs to be made in uh, guidance notes um, separate from the Act. I think we had a similar difficulty in debate in the uh, Community Empowerment Bill over the, uh, the, the um, what's wholly or mainly abandoned or neglected land. And I think in the end with that, uh, that bill, that act, um, there was pretty clear guidance on what ministers would take into account and what they would consider in making the decision on whether land was wholly or mainly abandoned or neglected. And I think something similar would need to be uh, the case here. I think there would need to be detailed policy guidance on what ministers, um, how ministers will interpret this phrase and what they will take into account. And I think the danger is, if there isn't that, then the first time which you, if we, where ministers um, decide that a transfer should take place to further sustainable development and you have an aggrieved landowner, that landowner will go to the, uh, the sheriff uh, as he's entitled to do, and it will then be the sheriff who will make the decision on um, his interpretation of 
sustainable development, his interpretation of significant harm, his interpretation of significant benefit. Um, so, and you know, the courts can sometimes make surprising decisions in these things. So I think it's probably better if uh, Parliament itself makes it clear what it, what it intends the, uh, the interpretation to be. Thank you for that. Uh, Sarah Boyack had a point. It was a quick follow-up to Pete Ritchie's comment about local authorities being able to um, act on behalf of communities. And I was wondering for, for us as a committee to log that, that might be something we might want to come back to as the third party purchase on behalf of a community, whether we see local authorities as being a potential vehicle. So it's as much to log that as an issue rather than necessarily going into it just now, Convener. Thank you very much. I'm going to move on to, uh, I think Angus will move on from that to the the next part, which is basically uh, about common good land, and Christian Allard has a question from that. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask uh, Archie Rintour to explain uh, the submission that he made, and time he explained it, uh, maybe other members of the panel can give us uh, uh, their ideas about uh, the common good land and how it's defined in, the, in this legislation. And we know that, you know, passing the point that uh, what is put in this legislation is to uh, uh, resolve a particular point. But that particular point ended up weakening, maybe weaken a little bit the, what uh, the common good land is about and the status of the common good land and maybe a missed opportunity of what common good land could be and maybe could be central of the uh, land reform uh, particularly uh, when we talk about local authorities like Pete Ritchie talked about, uh, we maybe ended up in, in a view that common good land uh, will be extended, so will mean uh, a lot more disposal of common good land and maybe no, no more uh, a question of maybe local authority would like to acquire uh, more uh, common good land so we could maybe update that status. And on the other hand, uh, maybe the register could comment on this, uh, not identified uh, uh, owner, if there is no identified owner for any any land, uh, should it be automatically put in uh, com com common good land? So there's a lot of to talk about common land, but first of all, I would like Archie Rintold to let us know about uh, the reason why he, f he thought it should be abolished. Right, Archie Rintold. Thank you, convener. I think the, by and large, local authority assets are managed by chartered surveyors, and we've had another number of chartered surveyors who are involved in asset management who have expressed a view to RICS that um, there really is no need to have a separate class of local authority assets under common good. It's over 40 years since you could create anything, uh, any common good land. Um, and it, whether it's common good land or whether it's land held um, through another, the more normal uh, term of land ownership for local authorities. It's essentially all land which is held by the local authority for the benefit of the community, which that local authority represents. Um, so it's certainly the view of tho many of those who are uh, involved in asset management and are chartered surveyors that um, there is no longer the need to distinguish between uh, land which is common good land and land which is not. Okay, uh, Sarah Jane Lang. Convener, um, I wonder if I could take my Scottish Land and States hat off and make a comment on, on common good land as a, as a private citizen and um, completely disagree with Archie Rintoul on, on that point. Um, I come from the borders and for those of you who know the area, there's a significant um, a significant acreage and, and properties in, in common good ownership. I'd just like to stress the importance of common good land to, um, to communities, not just in the borders but others. And I'd be really concerned with any provisions which weaken scrutiny um, of the misuse of common land, good land by local authorities. And I say that as a former local authority employee who's involved in um, selling off common good land um, because that, that was common practice at, at the time. Um, I, I have seen time and time again local authorities mishandle and misuse common good land um, within our communities. And I do think that there, there is a need to um, preserve it going forward. Okay, um, Peter Peacock. Well, I want to take this comparatively rare public opportunity to agree with Sarah Jane Lang, but I can, <laughs> I can do so because she said she'd take, she, exactly, as a private citizen. But I mean, I think she's absolutely right about that, 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 you know, it'd be terrible to think that we would just do away with hundreds of years of history at the stroke of a pen, simply because it was kind of administratively, incon you know, inconvenient anymore. 
uh, if, I, if I'm interpreting what Mr. Rintoul said accurately, because you know, not only does it represent good history, it represents an asset for the community. And I, in the spirit of which Mr. Allard spoke, I mean, it seems to me rather than talking about doing away with it, is how do we modernise it and make it relevant for today, and how do we get more of it rather than less of it? So, but that's the challenge. This bill doesn't deal with that. Maybe that's one of the tasks for the Land Commission is to get on with thinking about how you do that and, and enliven it and make it modern and make it more um, democratic very locally for local communities to use their assets uh, more effectively. Well, thank you very much. We've got different points of view in that and that's what this committee is here to uh, review in due course. I think that possibly answers your questions, Chris John. Well, I'd like to thank the panel who've been very well disciplined and have had lots of chances to put their points over just now to us. We welcome that and uh, we'll have a uh, uh, five minute suspension just now to allow a change of witnesses and uh, stretch our legs. Thank you. Okay, we resume our discussions on the Land Reform Bill and uh, I welcome, welcome our third and last panel of witnesses today. And uh, I very welcome uh, to our discussions to Rachel Bromby, Managing Agent for Codder Estates, and to John Glenn, the Chief Executive of Buclew Estates. Um, kicking off with the issues related to land rights and responsibilities statement, um, both of you um, set out extensive areas where you contribute to the common good and, and so on and so forth. Um, to some extent, do you think that uh, it could be emotive or ideological, uh, this statement? Um, how, you know, do you think the current proposals could be improved? Or do you think, in fact, that there shouldn't be such a statement? Uh, Rachel, first of all, perhaps. Thank you, convener. Um, we welcome a land rights and responsibilities policy statement. However, we feel that this must be have specific and very achievable targets in it. We do feel already that there are a lot of um, codes of conducts and initiatives in place that um, are helping achieve such responsibilities. One concern that we have is that specific legislation um, could become too prescriptive and actually prevent dynamism of management and land ownership and land management. I think already there's a lot of good being done by landowners and those in control of land, such as tenant farmers. We engage extensively with the local communities. We engage and welcome um, people onto the estate to encourage openness. We work with the Royal Highland Educational Trust to bring children onto the estate and explain more about where their food comes from and what goes on. Um, we are keen to generate public benefit from private land um, and feel this must be for the benefit of all. We're a well-established entity, but we do welcome greater partnership and collaboration with local communities. Um, therefore, we would like to see this, but what is happening already must be taken on board. Okay. Uh, John Glenn, want to comment just now first? Yeah. Uh, yes, actually, I think like quite a lot of um, what is in this bill, it has the potential to do something quite positive. Um, if drafted the wrong way, can actually be quite negative. I think if it encouraged us to have a conversation about what it is that we're trying to deliver and what are therefore the roles and responsibilities of both sides, um, then I think that's a very useful conversation to have. I think that the difficulty is um, that you, you have to start with a diagnostic of what's wrong today. And that's a very uncomfortable discussion that a lot of people seem to want to run away from. Um, because when you look at the situation, I mean, there is practically no land use in Scotland that is not influenced by policy and subsidy. So culturally and behaviorally, and I'm generalizing and there are always going to be exceptions, um, but we have developed a culture in a lot of rural Scotland which is like Pavlov's dog, basically, whatever the new next subsidy or handout comes in, we'll run off and chase that. And we have squeezed out a sense of entrepreneurship um, as to you know what can we actually achieve. That's not part of the conversation that we seem to be to be having. There are some 
really meaningful conversations, and we'll come on to it perhaps in, when we get on to consultations, in my experience there, conversations about the relationship between rural and urban. Increasingly, um, rural is seen as an offset for environmental misbehavior in urban, um, whether it's in renewable energy or whether it's um, you know, in carbon sequestration or whatever, and the mechanisms that you know, actually affect the relationship between urban and rural, are they really what they should be? Are our policies on how we hand out the sweeties, are they aligned or are they contradictory? And how does it fit in with planning and housing, which also doesn't seem to be terribly well aligned? So if by making this statement it encourages to, ha to have this conversation and actually have the courage to talk about a diagnostic, then I would be all for it. Well, a conversation is something that can be perhaps debated or uh, endorsed by Parliament. Uh, therefore, it's a conversation that can go all the way through the country. Um, so I take it that you would agree with those. Uh, yes. Those, that that uh, line of travel. Absolutely. Uh, Rachel Bromby? I think one of the things that's not made clear at the moment within this part of the legislation as it's drafted is the impact these changes of the Land Reform Bill might have, particularly on the likes of food production, on sustainability of existing farm and estate businesses, the potential impact of tourism, which is something that's not been um, discussed in great detail today, and also a strategy for future investment in rural communities, which is what makes uh, Scotland such a diverse and interesting place to be. So, we talked about them linking up with other policies and so on. Um, John Glenn's made it clear that he thinks that, uh, you know, planning and many other things, uh, as you have yourself, Rachel. But, um, you know, how should landowners who do not contribute to the common good as extensively as the panel would wish should be encouraged to engage positively because there are points of view. John Glenn mentioned both sides. Well, the side of the good is to have that conversation. It's not about two sides in a story in that sense, but it's about good relations and bad relations. So how do we encourage people if we don't have a land reform uh, statement that you can measure people's behavior against? Well, I, I think you know we, we do want to encourage that. I think we've got to look at the, the, the practicalities and do a little bit of segmentation. Um, there's one segment which is about a conversation about the current land uses and how they affect, affect people's lives and whether they, they work or they don't work. Um, and then there's a whole separate process about when you're seeking to change something, which usually involves set consultation processes and, and, and all the rest of it. So if we take... If we take the former, it is a vastly complex subject as to, I mean, there's very little land in Scotland that only has one use. I mean, it is a layering of uses. Um, and my experience is that, you know, we've not been very good at getting our own thoughts and the methodologies that we use to say, why did we make that choice before we change anything? Why did we make that choice to do that over there and this over here? And what impact does that have? So we've got to do some preparation to sort of say, it's not done in a black box. You know, it has been thought through. So, you know, getting the space to do that. Now, the second point then becomes, okay, you do it. Well, who are you going to engage with? And in what sequence? Um, it's not obvious. I mean, all around Scotland, communities are, are very different. Um, in, in this part of the country, you might have very much more geographically defined communities. In other parts of Scotland, the interface between what is urban and rural tends to get a lot more fluid. Um, so the nature of communities isn't, in, in some areas, so, so easily identifiable. Then we've also got to figure out that, um, and if you don't have something to say, one of the problems I find is that we you know when we try and do this, um, who turns up? So you go along and you'll go and have a, you, know, you might identify a geographic community. You'll find that they are of an age. 
they are invariably not involved actively in one of the land uses. So you don't get a lot of farmers turning up <laughs> for a conversation <laughs> about land use, even if it's not in, you know, in the middle of February in, in the evening. Um, so you're going to get a, a you're going to get a section of a population that are going to have their own preconditions and their own interests. Then you've got parts of community that aren't actually part of a physical community. They are parts of a community of interest. Now, of course, they don't participate in that. They reserve their ability to protect their lobby um, by staying outside of that conversation. Some yep. of these issues related to engaging communities in decisions. Sorry, I thought that was the nature of your question. Uh, which is a bit later on. I mean, specifically, I was asking there about, you know, how can we encourage um, some landowners to engage more positively? I think by giving them some positive examples. And what my, my experience would be that there's a population out there that can develop best practice. There's a population that would like to follow best practice but are looking for a bit of leadership. And yes, <laughs> there's a bit of them out there that don't want to engage. But at least by going down this route, it will become much more clear as to who are the ones that don't want to engage. And therefore, you're much better able to target that kind of behavior rather than tarring everybody with the same brush. Do Codder estates have a view like that? I mean, you, you asked us about d discussing things like business, tourism, and so on. We take that on board. But engaging with people, how do we encourage that dialogue? I think one of the points you have made is about um, those landowners and engaging specifically with landowners. But I think in this instance, um, it's a wider context that you need to be looking at landowners do not necessarily have direct and first control of the land. There are a multiplicity of interests, um, again, um, specifically looking at the likes of tenant farmers um, who have long-term control over a piece of land. Looking at other bodies, landowners are often um, subject to so much other scrutiny from the likes of SNH, um, the likes of SEPA, that we already have a great deal of legislation that we have to take account of. And therefore, we may engage uh, to a greater or lesser extent with communities, but there are things that stop us necessarily um, being able to take on board all those community points. And I think I agree very much and echo John's comments, and I know we're going to come on later, um, to communities. But again, we tend to see um, time and again that it's those with specific, um, sometimes personal interests, who are looking to engage with landowners and land managers, and not necessarily gaining the opinion of the wider community. Well, this is a high-level statement we're talking about at the beginning of this process, and uh, we're looking, you've agreed that it should be debated and endorsed, so the, the whole point is that uh, it does have to look at um, some of these things. So I think, you know, because we've strayed on to some other things, that it probably be a case that we should look at uh, who will be discussing this and how you discuss with communities in due course. Right, the Scottish Land Commission is being set up, and Dave Thompson has a question for you about that just now. Uh, I thank you, uh, convener. It's really just to repeat what I've been asking uh, other panellists, and that's about the title of the Land Commission, whether reforms should be included uh, in that, and also the um, public consultation aspects um, of the strategic plan, wh whether there has to be public consultation or should the minister just get it directly from the commission. Who first? John Glenn. Um, right. Do I think that the, the word reform has to be in the title of the bill? Um, no. If everybody understands what we're trying to achieve and the job description is written properly for these commissioners, they should do that. I would you know, separate out what is an information exchange about the day-to-day, -day, and I think there is a need to engage on that, because engaging with people when you don't want something is different to engaging with them when you want something on both sides. Um, so I think my answer to that bit is no, I don't think you need the name 
that had the word reform in there. I think it's implicit that this is about making things better. Um, but reform doesn't mean, if you take the definitions of reform, it doesn't, it separates out from radical um, to evolution. And reform is around evolution. It's a progressive making of things better. Um, and just, a, you know, if we do stick to the definitions, but I don't think you need it in the, uh, in, in the bill as a title. Mitchell. Again, I would concur with John's comments. I think um, what we are looking at with the Land Reform Bill and going forward with the Land Commission is about change and looking to make better. But with the word reform in there, it's a permanent emphasis on change, and change for change's sake is not necessarily the right way to be considering this. Thank you. Uh, further points, Steve? Convener, just to follow on in terms of the membership of the the, the Land Commission, the experience and expertise, uh, and I um, notice that there's a, a, a view um, th uh, that um, the Agricultural Holdings Commissioner shouldn't be a member of the Land Commission, that these two things are quite separate and they should sit totally separately. Could you just expand a wee bit on your reasoning behind that? John Glenn, no, whoever. <laughs> um, well, I, I think that there is a, the, the, the challenges facing agriculture are of sufficient import that they deserve to be treated separate. And it isn't just about the relationship between landowners and tenants. There is a fundamental challenge facing agriculture, and we need to do something. We have a, a generational change which is about to happen. And if we don't get the changes right now in agriculture in its broadest form, you are condemning the next generation to a pretty poor prospect. So I think it's of such import that it deserves a look of its own. Now, why might you lump it in? It depends on whether, you, as part of your objective, is you have this desire to see a fragmentation of land ownership. If that is the reason why you're lumping it into land reform, fine. Well, then say that's what it's about, but not everybody will agree that that's the right vision for agriculture. I am one of the largest, not personally, but as per clue, one of the largest farmers in Scotland. I will have a different view on what should happen in agriculture than probably just about everybody around this table. Um, we need to have that conversation, and we need the space to have that conversation, and I don't think muddying it up with other considerations does its service. Hear what you've got to say, yes, Dave? Take a, a quick follow-up. Um, is there not an argument, though, if, if the agricultural uh, holdings issues and all the rest of it are, are such a big part of it, that it's beneficial to have it uh, all together and the, the, the agricultural commissioner, uh, you know, feeding in to the broader uh, land commission debates? If, if what we're going to have a a conversation about is about land use, then absolutely. If it's predominantly about a redistribution of ownership, then I think it, it takes away from the real debate on agriculture, which is what is the future for agriculture in Scotland and how should it be configured and is it the same configuration everywhere in Scotland or does it have to be different? Um, you know, it's about getting clarity of, of, of effort. The, the other um, point about the, the range of experience and expertise within uh, the, the Land Commission, I see you have uh, views about including land management experience and so on, but we heard earlier from Peter Peacock of Community Land Scotland looking for people on there. There's a small number of them, obviously, half a dozen, you know, people of vision and integrity, etc., rather than representing sectoral interests. Otherwise, where do you stop? What's your view on that? I would agree with Peter. Right, OK. I actually, as I've reflected more on it, actually what you want is people that are curious, that have integrity, that can ask the questions, um, that know how to make trade-offs. Now, some of the times you'll find them are people with experience from land management. Some of the times you'll find them, they come from a legal background or whatever. The main thing is you, that they have these kind of characteristics and they have the ability to carry people with them. Because, you know, let's be clear, the land use debate, my advice to anybody 
going out and starting to engage <laughs> on land use debate is wear a safety belt and get some protective clothing because it's really hard. <laughs> Just from um, your, your evidence as well that um, you feel that the commissioner should have a checks and balances role uh, within um, their remit to, uh, remit, remit to review the effectiveness and consistency of the use of public funds by the Scottish Government. Um, does, would that checks and balances role extend to looking at the use of public funds by landowners? Yeah. So I mean, I think what we've got as, as, as a nation is to see we are, we are throwing a ton of money at land use in its broadest sense. It's not very clear what we expect in return and whether the allocation of those monies is consistent and coherent and are the parties that are handing out the sweeties, if I can say it that way, actually are incentivizing things that are coherent and consistent or not, and, and are they consistent through time? Mm. So yes, I think it should have public scrutiny as to how we spend money and what do we get for it? That, so, uh, sorry, sorry, I, I was just gonna say, yeah. uh, would that not um, expand the, the scope and the work of the Land Commission quite significantly? Um, because as you say, it's uh, big, big sweeties, I think, is the way I would put it. <laughs> I think, it, I think it would, but it's, you know, if we're going to make a real difference with this bill, what I'd hate to see is we, we go through all of this time and effort, and yes, we come out with a bill the other it makes not that much difference, and we'll be back at it again in 10 years' time, um, you know, because we didn't really address the real issues the last time. And at the end of the day, you have to start, though, with a diagnostic, which is, what's wrong with it right now? And why is it not fit for purpose as to what we're achieving? And we're not having that conversation. Thank you. May I pick up on the points between um, the land commissioners and having a separate um, tenant farming commissioner? Um, I think in experience at the moment, there can be some conflict between landlords and tenants. Um, I think that's very unfortunate. And I think because of some of the current provisions of the Agricultural Holdings Act, um, the way we look now at matters such as rent reviews, and I appreciate that Agricultural Holdings is part of um, another um, evidence session, but the way we look at the moment, we need to build trust between the two parties. We need to build um, better relationships, um, something that often we have with the community because we can have dialogue. Um, at the moment, the way things are structured with landlord and tenant, it's a very adversarial, adversarial situation um, that we're making reference to the land court and so forth. If we have a specific tenant farming commissioner who has access to um, s good stakeholder involvement, good legal advice, good professional advice, then this will help very much improve those relationships. There's a lot of history in Scotland, um, which a lot of baggage, which I think um, we need to lose um, moving forward. As you'll tell from my accent, I'm not Scottish by birth. Um, and I come into this, and to me, it's quite surprising um, that this is the situation that we have, that there isn't this dialogue between landlords and tenants. Um, and therefore, I think that with engagements with the likes of the RICS, um, with NFUS, with Scottish Lands and Estates, with these involvements, again, the, the RICS, the Agricultural uh, Valuers and Arbiters, um, these people act on behalf of both landlords and tenants, and they can give valuable um, evidence and assistance to a tenant farming commissioner that is perhaps currently lacking. Thank you very much for that. I mean, my understanding is that the tenant farming uh, commissioner and commission will be dealing with all the tenant farming issues, and what the commissioner would be doing here would be adding that expertise into the broader land commission uh, discussions and debate. So you know, as opposed to the Land Commission dealing with tenant farming issues. I think I'm right in thinking that. I think, um, you know, I, I give me an example where it, it, it does make sense. We've uh, gone through an exercise of modelling every single tenant, uh, every single farm, in-house or 
um, tenanted farm on the estate and we're working with SRUC to try and refine those models. Now, what does it tell us? It tells us, and this is modelled on the basis of you know, a top quartile kind of performance. So I've dehumanised, if I can put it that way, the debate or taken the emotion of the individual tenant out of it and just said, if I assumed a top quartile performance of that definition of a farm, does it make sense? What does it deliver? The conclusion that I draw looking at ours is that there is a significant proportion of our farms that don't make any sense. The question is, what do I do about it? Uh, they don't economic make economic sense, sense, social sense, no, they don't make economic environmental sense. sense. It, 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 it's just, we'll get on to a debate about what sustainability, and I completely disagree with, with Peter on that. Economics. They do not make economic sense. <coughs> All right. Um, we're going to move on to information about the control of land, and Sarah Boyack is going to lead on this. Thank, by you, thank you very much, Convener. I want to pick on your expertise and perspectives as um, representatives of landowners and say, what do you think um, the sanctions might be for non-compliance with providing information to the keeper? What do you think would be effective in terms of people who own land to come to the table? Rachel. Yeah. I have to say that's a question I haven't given um, a huge amount of consideration to specifically about the, the sanctions. I think the first point I would like to make is that we do welcome the transparency of ownership. Um, the ultimate sanctions, which we've already heard about today, would be um, not having the right to have your ownership, your title registered um, by the keeper. Um, I think that the way we are going with voluntary registration, I think we will see an awful lot of landowners um, bringing forward voluntarily land ownership. And I think it will be something that needs more consideration when we see who it is that is not willing to register land. And I don't believe necessarily that that's going to be the likes of estates like Corda, like the Clue. Um, I think there will be those perhaps with not necessarily the extensive numbers of acres under ownership, um, but those that have perhaps smaller, no more strategic areas of land. And I think until we see where the problem lies, it might be difficult to determine what the sanctions are. Yeah, thank you. I, I, would, I, would completely I would completely agree with that. I think actually there is, with a good a bit of leadership, there's actually a benefit to landowners, because if you've got it on the register, it's a lot easier when you're doing individual land transactions, and we're doing them all the time. But my God, when you're trying to do it off the existing systems, the research that you have to do to go and find the paperwork, find, you know, it's not where we thought it was. The boundaries change. If you had it on a, on a, on a digital format, on a proper land, it makes your own internal processes a lot easier to do. So actually, I think, the penny will drop for a lot of people to say it makes the business of running estates easier. <coughs> There's a bit of a hump to get over, and I, I admire my colleague from the Register, uh, the Register of Scotland's confidence about his timetable. Whew. It's complicated stuff. I mean, things are not where you think they are. <laughs> if there's any further points, uh, Sarah can come back. Okay, thank you, convener. My questions specifically for Codder Estates. I, I wonder, uh, Rachel, how, how you Codder Estates can support a, a full land registry given transparency of ownership and land use without a restriction on ownership to EU registered entities. And can I ask what evidence you can provide to support your statement that there are legitimate concerns regarding inward investment or existing investment? Um, I think in the first instance, um, by stipulating that there should be non-EU entities, that suggests that um, any non-EU entities have very much nefarious intentions about land management um, and land ownership in Scotland. And conversely, it suggests that simply by being an EU entity or um, uh, someone, a, 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 a natural person, is by definition going to be a good manager and owner of land. 
Um, and I think that's something we've, we've heard a lot about this already today, that there is transparency out there already about who owners are. Um, so far as evidence about legitimate concerns about inward investment, I don't have any empirical evidence. I haven't prepared myself any studies or investigation in relation to this. But we know both anecdotally and from what is happening elsewhere that those who are heavily invested um, in Scottish land, if they're finding it more difficult to be ownership, will say simply take their money and, and, and take it elsewhere. And at the moment, um, landowners good landowners, good land managers, put a lot of money into the Scottish economy, sometimes for very, very little return. And from an eco economic perspective, to lose that would be, well, um, disastrous is perhaps maybe too strong a word, but I don't think it is. We're talking about significant employment, significant money supporting rural schools, through that employment supporting local businesses, local shops. And I would just hate to see that go. Predicting almost an Armageddon there. What evidence is, uh, is there of that going to happen? As I said, I don't have empirical evidence. I haven't prepared any studies. I haven't conducted any any specific research myself. Um, we know this anecdotally. We know this from I know this from talking to other land managers. But I couldn't give you a specific example sitting here today. Could, one might argue, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? <laughs> you know. Yes, um, but at the same uh, juncture, you could say, you know, the opposite. As, 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 as I said in the introduction to the question, um, just because one is an EU entity or a natural person doesn't mean that one has the best interests of the land or land management at heart. And to rule out others and their investment, I think, is short-sighted. Sorry, Kavira. How do you react, though, to, to that stat that was mentioned earlier on that 750,000 acres of Scotland's land is owned by trusts. I mean, that, that, you know, surely we need full transparency of who owns the land, uh, land of this country. Speaking personally, Corda is owned in, in trusteeship. Um, that is transparent. It's a matter of public record as to who those trustees are. Every time we want to sell an area of land, be it half an acre or, or whatever, when we're, we engage solicitors, they want to go through the money laundering regulations. They want to see um, utility bills from the trustees. They want to know who the trustees are. They want to see copies of the trust documents. Trustees are there as a sense check to um, individuals. They're there to provide often professional advice Personally, I don't see trustee ownership as a problem. It's, it's trustees are guardians of the land. Trustees are guardians of estates, protecting um, what is there for future generations. Dave wants to ask. A, Dave Thompson wants to ask a short supplementary. Th uh, thank you very much, convener. I'm intrigued at, at um, the revelation that if um, you know uh, uh, people are identified in relation to their ownership and we get transparency and all the rest of it, that there will be an exodus of, of money and, and they'll all run somewhere else. And I, I, it just strikes me, I just wonder, if that's the case, why, why do they do it uh, at the moment? I mean, what's the motivation? Um, do we just have all these altruists out of the goodness of their heart look at Scotland and say, ah, oh, we want to pump money into Scotland and just throw it away uh, because it's the right thing to do. I just don't, it doesn't compute to me. It just doesn't uh, stack up. Or are there other reasons why they do this? Uh, you know, do they have money that they want to clean up? Or, I mean, what's the reason? It, it's just bizarre. I think your comment there about money that they want to, 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 to clean up, um, I think the land reform bill is not the place to be looking at that. I think that's something uh, we heard mentioned earlier. I think, um, you know, we didn't specifically mention Police Scotland, but these are things that are criminal activities and not something that the land reform bill is here to, to detail. Question, so, uh, uh, why would people want to put money in here if, there would, if transparency would actually stop them from doing it? That means they must have something to hide. Um, not necessarily, no, but there tends to be 
often um, additional regulation that comes in. I, it's not the transparency that I have an issue with. It's what I have an issue with is the initial drafting of the legislation, and it has now been altered, and which is what we welcome, is that if non-EU entities cannot hold land, then there is not necessarily the opportunity for them to invest in that land. Um, Corda, which obviously is my experience, um, isn't uh, foreign ownership. It is very much UK ownership, um, indeed Scottish ownership. And we invest in land because we believe in a dynamic, dynamic rural economy. We believe in employing people. We believe in managing the landscape to deliver um, public good, to deliver what the public want to see. Yeah, can I um, maybe see a little bit of clarification? We seem to be complaining two different things. There's, there's land held in trusts, and then there's land held in trusts in regimes that are not prepared to show to share information should a request go in. I'm not clear in my head, as I'm not knowing where the source of the 750,000 acres is, that are we talking about just land held in trust, or is it a subset of that, which is it's land held in trusts that are registered in tax regimes that are not prepared to divulge information? I think it's much simpler than that. I mean, I mean maybe I misheard uh, earlier, but if um, restricting land holdings in Scotland to, uh, or excluding non-EU entities would lead to people taking their money out of Scotland, why? I, I, actually, I, I think it's, it's, one, it's one more of sort of billboard stuff. I, like so many of these things, if people actually, if they're really determined and they want to come and invest, they'll look below, beyond the headlines and make their decisions on the basis of the reality of the situation. However, sometimes, you know, how you put your banner up and say, are we open for business, does have an impact. Whether they were ever serious about wanting to do it and they're going to be turned off just because they've got to set up an EU registered company, it's very subjective. So I'm, I'm not overly, con as long as a genuine interest is actually going to look beyond a slight signal that they might perceive to say, if you're not one of us, you can't come here. No. We have to move on, yeah. I'm afraid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> engaging the communities in decisions relating to land. Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you, convener. But both of you will have heard the previous discussions we've had relating to this part of the bill. And I don't want just to sort of blindly repeat what, what I put to the previous panel as well. Um, John Glenn, you, you earlier on intimated you might had, in fact, you were already starting to say something about this. But um, I really wondered whether you had anything to add to the previous discussions that we've had on this or what your views on this are, um, and just give us your opinion. Um, <coughs> Um, my experience on this is, and, and each type of consultation is, is different depending on whether it's a major change, the scale of the change, who the communities are, but I think we need to look at what's happening on the other side of the engagement. Um, what I can guarantee to you is no matter which way you do consultation and engagement, it'll be wrong. You'll talk to the wrong person, you'll talk to them in the wrong sequence, and you'll get pilloried. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I, I've tried every single which way at, at this, and every single time somebody has found a reason to give me a hard time because I didn't do it right. So it's just a fact. Now, we also need to have a conversation about what is community. And in consultation processes, should we have a mechanism that says, if you don't engage in the consultation process, it's a sort of use it or lose it. You can't stand aside, because the trouble is a lot of people don't engage in the consultation, and then they moan and bitch about it <laughs> afterwards, or they go to the press. Even within politicians, I'll get one politician saying, well done, this is absolutely what we want to do, and another one's off to the press saying, that's a conspiracy, and I think we need to be a little bit real <laughs> about what it's actually like doing it. Um, you know, I'll give you an example of, you know, community engagement, um, I had a group come to see me down in Cannonby. And they were the Cannonby 
residents association. So I said, well, wh why am I engaging with you? I, I engage with the local authority. And they said, well, they don't represent us. Well, right, I thought that was a democratic process. But I also engage with the community councillors. Oh, well, they don't represent us either. Oh, well, who are you? And well, we're the Canonbury Residents Association. I said, well, so do you have to be a resident of Canonbury to be in the red? Well, no, we have friends of the <laughs> residents of Canonbury. And I said, who might they be? <laughs> and it's you bust them in. <laughs> They're the NGOs, the whatever it is. So it's <laughs> it's rather more complicated than we seem to be making out in all of this. <laughs> It's not easy to define what, and should they be democratically based? The turnouts are really low. <laughs> no wonder people say, well, they don't really represent us. Well, you know, if you've only got a sort of 15% turnout for a community council, and the, when you go along to them, look at the age group. Are they really making decisions about what's in the interest of the next generation in economic development? Or are they making decisions to say, actually, I moved here. <laughs> because I wanted a quiet life and I don't really want anything to happen here. <laughs> They're consulted. Okay, and, uh, but you know, I think we've got to be very much more specific than this. But uh, Alec Ferguson want to ask anything supplementary to that? Well, I, I, I mean, we, we, we talked about guidance and the fact that uh, I think it's generally now accepted that people feel that the guidance should be endorsed by Parliament. So the process will have a... Uh, uh, an endorsed set of rules, if you like, that people can... I mean, you say, how do you go about the, 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 the engagement? And, and that will be, although I'm not happy about the fact that the details are still yet to be arrived at, evidently that will come in time. Um, I, I get the impression that doesn't give you a lot of comfort that this will be a meaningful process. But I wonder if... Can, uh, can you give us examples or, or explain how you think meaningful engagement with a community from the estate manager's point of view can take place, I, either of you? I think already, and, and this has been alluded to at, at quite great length, and, and, and I don't want to be repeating some of the comments that have been made already, um, and again, that, that John has just raised, because we have come across these, these same points already. Um, for example, perhaps not directly answering your question, but we have recently consulted on our new long-term forest plan, and Sarah Jane Lang mentioned earlier sitting in drafty halls. Um, we did actually have very good turnout to that, and a lot of the comments were taken on board. But again, I think there was um, a lack of understanding from the community and residents as to what that engagement was about, because a lot of the points that were raised were general land management issues, um, more interested in whether gates should be open or locked, whether there were dog fouling issues, day-to-day -day management that could have been addressed and are there to be addressed in, in, in different circumstances, rather than the impact um, on the landscape of a particular felling or, or particular planting um, species, this sort of thing. And I think this is where the guidance has to come in. Land managers, I'm not saying we're all perfect or we all know, we, we are all learning all the time. Um, but I think we have perhaps um, a longer term view than some members of the community. I think often those that are within some of these communities, whether it be a community of place, a community of interest, often have very single issues, single issue views that they are looking at, uh, at having represented and are not looking at the strategic long term land management issues that sometimes we are interested in and wanting their input. John Glenn, yeah, yeah briefly. Yep. I think you've got to separate out between what is um, about a significant change and what is about a piece of communication about what are we doing on the day-to-day -day basis. Now, the day-to-day -day basis takes many, many different shapes. Are you going to put out a guidance that'll fit everything? Actually, I'd like to believe it's down to people and they should get on with it and talk to all, you know, various parties more complicated is the consultation process where you're, you're actually looking to change something. So it's not the same thing. Does, does that uh, cover those points, Alec? Yeah, Very good. Well, we'll move on to the we're right to good. buy land for further sustainable development. Angus MacDonald to lead. Okay, uh, thanks, Convener. Um, from the submissions that we've received from both uh, 
Clyde of the Estates and, and Buccleuch Estates, um, th there seems to be a mixed reaction to the, the issue of right to buy uh, land to further sustainable development. Um, Coyder Estates, for example, have welcomed the principle of community ownership, especially where a, a landowner is in breach of good land management and nefariously treats tenants and other stakeholders. Uh, however, Buclew uh, Estates have stated they're unclear why there is a requirement for another piece of legislation and where this fits with uh, those already in place. So, uh, given that, how should the Scottish Government establish whether a landowner has breached good land management or has nefariously treated tenants or other stakeholders? So, uh, Rachel, to start off with, I hope. Thank you, Convener. Um, one of the issues with the legislation as drafted, and again, it's been mentioned at length today, is the lack of clarity um, within uh, the bill on its face. Um, Again, be it whether it's definition of what is a community, what is a definition of public good, um, what is the definition of sustainable development. I think where a landowner is actively managing the land, um, be it through farming, be it through engaging with tenants and communities, there is a way of demonstrating what is in the public good. Um, what is in the good of dynamic um, rural management. Where there is perhaps some difficulty is saying, yeah, this is a particularly bad landowner. Um, what is the definition of that? And again, like sustainable development, uh, one person's view, um, one particular interest group's view is going to be diametrically opposed to, to, to others. It is not my job here today to say how that is defined. Um, my job is to ensure that Cordero Estates is managed to the best of my abilities, um, to the benefit um, of the owners of that land, to those who are in control, who those who are participants. Again, tenants, as well as farming tenants, we have a large number of residential tenants. We provide an awful lot of, of, of housing and accommodation within the local community and area, as, and, and also jobs. Um, from my perspective, I think a lot of legislation is not always good, but at the same time, there needs to be what, what is proposed, there needs to be more careful thought and definition um, put into the uh, legislation as enacted rather than into secondary legislation that there won't be necessarily an opportunity to consult on. Angus, yeah. Um, perhaps you explain our position on it. If compulsory purchase is not working, why not change that bit of legislation rather than create another one? I mean, th that's really the basis of the point. We do have an issue with the definitions of, contrary to Peter Peacock, about sustainable economic development. Well, first of all, I'm not quite sure it always says economic. Um, sustainable development, is that sustainable from environment? Is it sustainable economic, is it sustainable economic without subsidy? Um, what are we talking about here? It's not obvious. And if you're going to take something away from somebody, I think it deserves to have a bit more clarity. Now, compulsory purchase does actually have some quite rigorous methodology around it. Now, if it doesn't quite fit, then maybe it needs a bit of adjustment. But I wouldn't just leave that and then create another one just because that one is a bit hard. I'd tackle that one. Right. Um, Graham Day would like a supplementary on that point. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to, to air this. Obviously, much of the debate has central, centred around bad landowners who are mm. not utilising the land they're managing for the, the public good. I just want to explore briefly, what about tenants who are acting in this way? And I wonder what your view would be of the idea of toughening up the cert Certificate of Bad Husbandry, uh, the provisions within that, to allow landowners to recover such tenancies, but only with a view to then passing the land on to non-viable units, I think as you touched upon earlier, uh, John, or to new entrants? I would be very, very much in favour. I mean, how many instances statistically have we had where a tenant has been evicted for bad husbandry in the last 10 years? I mean, statistically, can it be right? I think there have been so, so few. Now, statistically, that can't be representative. So, yeah, I, I think there is a need to really have some objective criteria. It's going to be very contentious, but nevertheless, let's have a bit of courage. 
And if we're going to ha yeah, hold people to account for better behaviour, well, let's hold everybody's to account for better behaviour. And I think it's a good idea. I couldn't agree more, um, both on, on, on your point um, and with what John is saying. We're talking today not just about land ownership, but land management, those who are in control of land. And I would love to see a tightening um, of the legislation um, to those that are not necessarily managing the land sustainably, be that economically, from a biodiversity perspective, whatever that might be, I think that would be superb. If I may, Camilla, but, but, but you would accept the rider that you, you didn't get that back to farm in hand, you got it back to issue to other tenants to make their units more viable or for new entrants. You would accept that as a criteria? Definitely. Well, I, I make it very clear, I'm in the interest of seeing successful agriculture. If we make the land use choice that the primary product is for agriculture, that's what we want to use it. I want to see the best agriculture I can performed by the best and most talented people. Okay. Thank you. That's useful. Thank you. Angus, uh, you've got a final point, I think. Yeah. Yeah. As you know, we've discussed uh, the issue of significant benefit and significant harm uh, with the other uh, two panels. So um, I'll have to ask the question again. When, when considering uh, how significant benefit or significant harm uh, is to be interpreted, how do the provision, pr provisions ensure that consideration uh, will be given to the impact on the landowner? And do you also um, feel that the provisions strike a fair balance between the rights of landowners and the general public interest in furthering sustainable development? Well, again, it's even, I think we should have clarity as what we mean by sustainable. Is it sustainable environmentally, economically, with, without subsidy? What are we talking about? Um, but, yeah, other, the devil will be in the detail when you actually get into decisions, and it's about trust. I mean, these are going to end up as judgment calls. Any further? A similar question to the one that's been asked of previous panels. Uh, should consideration be given to uh, providing for a direct power of ministerial intervention uh, to buy land to further sustainable development if there is no community interest, uh, if there is no community presence? Okay. As long as there was a clearly identified framework of criteria by which that call would be made, the question is really, do, do you judge, do, do you trust the ministerial judgment? What is the criteria of that choice? Because you'll have lots of different opinions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you cover the, that's all your points, is it? Um, well, there's also the, the oh. issue of um, uh, whether it's, it's possible that productive uh, farmland could be eligible for community purchase uh, as the provisions stand and, and whether it might be possible that a landowner or occupier's interests uh, do not align with the, the wishes of the local community. What would your view be on, on a situation like that? It, it sort of depends on what the current use of the, what is the landowner proposing to use the land for? I mean, if, he, if he's making, he or she is making a sound, they then say, well, but the community has got a better idea that we are into difficult space because then you're starting to interfere <laughs> with the right of somebody. You know, it's one thing taking it away for bad behavior, but if actually they're doing something, in fact, they might even be doing it because they're incentivized <laughs> by policy. I, I think you're in a different game if they're actually using it. It's not in your abandoned, neglected kind of sense. This is a farmer who's got a f field in Bali and the community wants to put up a table tennis whatever it is. <laughs> uh, Rachel. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of points I'd like to make in relation to that. Um, I think one of the areas that is absolutely fundamental to this debate, and it was made uh, very eloquently by the NFUS earlier today, is that sustainable food production is very, very important, and we mustn't lose sight of that. Um, as we sit here today, it's a lovely day, but I know from experience from our in-hand farming, from our tenant farmers that at the moment this is a particularly difficult time, what with weather and climate and one thing and another, and we mustn't lose sight of that. Moving on from that, I think with community ownership and community, community right to buy, um, it has to be assessed for financial viability. 
um, at the moment there has been, under the existing legislation, a lot of community um, buyouts, but we don't know in terms of transparency how that is being funded, how that is working moving forward. Is that subsidised? How much of that is already taxpayer money, um, EU subsidy money? And I think, again, um, there has to be more thought given about what happens in the future. What happens once the community have bought that land? Are they in, then in a position to sell that on to a developer, to someone else? And there shouldn't be the right for land to be forcibly um, purchased from a landowner or you know, someone who is uh, taken away from someone who is in control of that land, um, whereby their remaining holding, their remaining land is adversely affected. And I think that's something that has to be taken into consideration. It's useful to have indeed. Um, I'd like to thank our witnesses just now because uh, it's been a long... Pardon? Could you could I just... John's going to say no. Very last, uh, yes. and as, as a, a note of encouragement, my experience has been when you get everybody aligned, sadly my best experience started with a disaster, and the disaster was an open cast coal mine. It'd be nice to think we could learn the lessons and not have to start with a disaster, <laughs> but when you get everybody aligned, it is amazing what you can achieve. So I would say that as, a, as, a, as an encouragement <laughs> The question is, how do we learn the tricks of how do we get everybody aligned as opposed to setting them all off against each other? But it is amazing what you can do. It'd be nice to not start with a disaster. <laughs> I think your points are well made and we've had a good variety of opinions uh, in these panels. It's been most useful for us because as we build up a picture of this, we see the test that we need to put to see whether the land reform bill actually meets many of these positive engagement things which we've been dwelling on in this last panel uh, for quite a bit. So I'd like to thank Rachel Bromby and John Glenn for their part in this, along with the other witnesses that we've had today. Um, at the next meeting of the committee on Wednesday the 16th of September, the committee will take uh, further evidence on part 10 of the Land Reform Scotland Bill. We'll also consider two pieces of subordinate legislation. I'd like once again, to thank all the panels and the members of the public who've joined us today, Sky has hosted a major set of witness testimony that allows us a very large and varied insight into this question about the use and ownership of land. And I think it's vital for us to uh, have that. I think it's vital for the community here to know that they're contributing through hosting this the ability of us to actually meet people in every part of the country and we'll be continuing to do this for the next three months in this particular phase of our work. So thank you all very much uh, for attending and I now close the meeting. <laughs>